Welcome everyone to today's Town of Chatham Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. The date is April 8, the year 2021. This meeting is being recorded and will be available shortly hereafter for scheduled and on-demand viewing on any smartphone or tablet device. If anyone else is recording this meeting, please let us know. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law and the governor's March 23, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place and the many subsequent orders that have come, this meeting of the Chatham Zoning Board is being conducted by a remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. A reminder that persons who would like to listen to this meeting while in progress may do so by calling the phone number 508-945-4410. And they have to punch in the conference ID number. That is 945-111-158 and then hit the pound. Despite our best efforts, we may not be able to provide for real-time access and we will post a record of this meeting on the town's website as soon as possible. I'll now have a roll call of all the board members that authorizes this form of remote participation for a meeting. So, and please, uh, if you can think of it, give us your middle initial if you happen to have one. Uh, Dave Veach. David H. Veach, uh, yes, present. Paul. Paul C. Sample, yes, I vote to uh, conduct the meeting in this manner. Buck. James M. Upson, yes. Dave Thompson. David Reynolds Thompson, yes. Dennis. <clears throat> Dennis Sullivan, yes. Megan. Megan Virginia Story, yes. Bill. Uh, William W. Grau, yes. And I, David S. Nixon, vote yes. And I must, uh, I would like to introduce Bill to everyone. That includes not only his fellow ZBA members, but also the town in general. We welcome you, Bill, and look forward to many years of uh, participation. So I would ask that all citizens and non-board members participating in the call via the phone, we need to have your name, and the last digits of your phone number for identification purposes. The way we conduct the meeting is the hearing notice will be read. It'll be read by Sarah B. Clark. Sarah is the PPO, that's the principal permitting officer for the town of Chatham. She's also the executive secretary for the Zoning Board of Appeals and the HBDC. After the hearing has notice has been read, either the individual or their representative will present the appeal or application. Following the conclusion of that, I would then ask for anybody in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of the appeal of the application to do so and to indicate to Sarah, you use the little hand and have it go onto your screen so that she can pick it up and introduce you into the meeting. I would then read any and all letters we had received from whoever, neighbors, boards, whatnot. Following that, I would ask for anyone who wishes to speak against the appeal or the application to do so and, you know, tell us what you think and why. Then it could be that there'd be some rebuttal testimony. Then we would have board members direct questions to anyone who had presented anything during the previous points. When we were done and satisfied with our questions, we would then close the hearing and go into deliberation. Deliberation is only open to members of the board unless a member of the board interjects into the conversation uh, by invitation an individual who had presented something. We would then deliberate and we would vote. Uh, voting in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts on with Zoning Board of Appeals, there must be a super majority for you to be successful. Since there are five votes with the Chatham board, that means you need to get four yeses to be successful. Voting today would be Dave Veach, Paul, Buck, Dave Thompson, and myself. 
I don't think there's anything else to bring up. So, Sarah, our first appeal, please. Application number 21-017, Thomas and Susan Campbell, care of James M. Norcross Esquire, PO Box 707, Chatham, Mass, 02633. Mm -hmm. Owners of property located at 64 Barcliff Avenue, also shown in the town of Chatham's assessor's map 15G, block 14, lot 32. The applicant proposes to use the existing non-conforming cottage as an accessory dwelling unit, ADU, on a non-conforming lot, which requires the grant of a special permit. Also proposed is a demolition of the existing garage and the construction of a new dwelling and garage. The cottage is non-conforming, and that it is located 27.7 feet from the road where a 40 foot setback is required and 21.2 feet from the easterly abutter where a 25 foot setback is required. The existing garage is non-conforming and that it is located 22.3 feet from the westerly abutter where a 25 foot setback is required. The proposed dwelling and garage will comply with all bulk and dimensional requirements of the bylaw but is considered a substantial alteration and under the second accept clause of section 6 of Mass General Law chapter 40a such substantial alteration requires the grant of a special permit. The existing building coverage is 1,300 square feet, 4.2%, and the proposed building coverage is 3,090 square feet, 9.97%, where 10% is the maximum allowed. The lot is non-conforming in that it contains 30,002 square feet, where 40,000 square feet is required in an R40 zoning district. A special permit is required under Mass General Law Chapter Section Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Sections 6 and 9, and Sections 5B and 8D2B of the Chatham Protected Bylaw. Mr. Norcross. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Jamie Norcross representing Tom and Sue Campbell. On the call with me this afternoon are Tom and Sue, along with Caitlin Manfredo uh, from SB Design, who is the architect for the project. As uh, Sarah just read, um, we are seeking relief uh, under two sections of the bylaw. The first is for uh, the conversion of the uh, existing dwelling into an accessory dwelling unit uh, under a relatively new provision that was enacted a couple years ago. And the second uh, section under which we need relief is section VB. Um, and as Sarah read, even though we meet all uh, the new structures meet all dimensional and um, bulk requirements under the Bjorklund exception. Uh, in that case, law uh, is considered a substantial alteration, and so special permit approval is required as well. Um, just a bit of background. Tom and Sue purchased the property in 2018 and have become full-time residents this past year. Uh, the goal is to retire in the not-so-distant future and then uh, be able to live Many, many happy years here, uh, again, on a full-time basis. Um, the existing two-bedroom dwelling on the property is modest in size. It's just under 900 square feet. Uh, the structure dates back to the late 19th century. The Campbells um, have spent a significant amount of time working with their architect, Caitlin Manfredo, exploring options to create additional living area at the property while also maintaining the integrity of the historic structure. Um, Caitlin's going to speak on this in a bit in terms of the process that they went through. Uh, but the solution that the, Campbell, the Campbells and Caitlin propose is the construction of a new principal dwelling at the property and the conversion of the existing structure into an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, the Campbells, since moving to town on a full-time basis and, and prior to that to find the property, have become, uh, you know, have followed uh, newspaper and, and town events um, and have become very cognizant of the town's mission uh, not only to save historic structures, um, but also to increase the year-round rental rent inventory uh, with the goal of encouraging greater diversity of population uh, for young adult citizens and allow for aging in place for senior citizens. Uh, the Campbells uh, have designed a plan that provides them with increased living space conforming to all the zoning bylaws while addressing two major initiatives that are important to the town of Chatham. The, um, and again, Caitlin's going to touch on this in a minute, but Admittedly, it's it's probably seems a bit backwards in terms of the existing structures being converted to an accessory dwelling unit and the new structures being built. Um, but Caitlin and the Campbells worked very hard, and uh, with the building department and town staff, was very helpful in terms of going through the process, making sure that you know, provided um, we are able to get special permit approval as required, that this is a process that is allowable under the bylaw. In terms of current nonconformities at the property, uh, the existing lot is nonconforming uh, as to size, 
the existing dwelling is non-conforming uh, as it's set back uh, 27 and a half feet from Barcliff where 40 feet required and 21.2 feet from the east of the lot line where a 25 foot setback is required. The existing garage on the property is also not conforming uh, by a couple of feet to the westerly lot line. Uh, the proposed project consists of a construction of a new principal three bedroom dwelling located in the middle of the lot. Uh, additionally, the existing non conforming garage will be torn down and replaced with a new garage in a slightly different location that does meet setbacks. Uh, the existing two bedroom dwelling will be modified in the interior to eliminate one bedroom. And again, this would be the structure. Uh, at under 900 square feet that would be converted into an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, and the project includes the installation of a new IA septic system that allows for the additional bedroom at the property for a total of four. Uh, with regard to lot coverage, the total coverage is obviously increasing with the addition of a new structure, but at 9.97%, we're still below the 10% maximum allowed. Um, and of the total lot coverage of 3,090 square feet, only... Uh, over six, just over 1,600 square feet is for the proposed new principal dwelling. And so it's really not a large structure at all. As part of my client's diligence for this project, they spent a great deal of time determining a location for the new dwelling and garage that worked for the property and minimized impact on the neighborhood. Um, what they determined was that locating the new dwelling essentially in the middle of the lot would set the house back a significant distance from many neighbors, while also allowing for privacy between the new structure and the proposed ADU. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, I would ask Caitlin to run through the design as well as some of the um, um, their diligence that went into locating the property on site. Fine. Good afternoon. My name is Caitlin Manfredo. I'm an architect for SV Design in Chatham. Uh, Sarah, could you scroll to the Google Earth um, site plan? Moving all the way down at the end. While Sarah gets that, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, yep, there we go. Uh, so Jamie has touched on a few points that I'm going to bring up, but the uh, Campbells have purchased the property. They use it occasionally in the beginning and are now currently residing in the cottage as full-time residents of Chatham. Campbell's hired SV Design over a year ago to assist them in planning of their 64 Barcliff property. Uh, becoming full-time residents, they desired a house that better suited their long-time long -time needs and full-time status. We have spent a great deal of time over the last year reviewing many different options to expand their space while being respectful to the neighborhood and all the town regulations surrounding the property. Uh, we studied all the ZBA bylaws early on. We reviewed all the historical board requirements for the existing cottage. Um, we studied a lot of the neighborhood properties, uh, adjacent house sizes and homes and layouts. Um, we spent about a year planning and getting to this point. So we've reviewed a lot of different options. Uh, we looked at options of demoing the historical cottage and rebuilding it knowing that that would trigger a demo delay and the Campbells still really loved the historical cottage and truly didn't want to tear it down, especially where it is in great shape as well. Um, we reviewed yeah. options of doing an addition and renovation to the historical cottage um, to achieve the needs of the Campbells. This posed many obstacles as well with the historical boards and trying to um, find a balance between the historical cottage and adding a new addition to the rear. Um, after a lot of more continued research, we realized at some point that the existing historical cottage actually fit within the ADU requirements. Converting the historical cottage to an ADU meant it could be remained untouched and stay in its glory of the historical nature. While this is somewhat of a backwards approach to ADU status, I've been in communication with Sarah and Jay Briggs from the town during our planning process to confirm that our steps and approach to this application were done in a good manner. This option allowed the Campbells to have a more comfortable space to fit their full-time residential needs at the rear of the property, but also adding economical diversity to Chatham with the ADU and also respecting the historical nature of this existing cottage and its neighborhood. 
to the siting of the house, uh, the property is long and thin, surrounded by five neighboring prop uh, neighboring homes. So we're kind of a little bit of an island in between. Um, it was very important with the Campbells early on that they wanted a lot of bit of, a lot of privacy, but they also wanted to respect their neighbors' privacy as well. So they also didn't want to overpower the historical cottage in the front um, if that was to remain. So we tried to equally cite the house between all the surrounding neighbors to not impact one more than the other. Locating the house almost in the middle of the property, the house is skewed in a way to match the existing cottage angle and to fit within all the required dimensional, re um, dimensional requirements of the zoning bylaws. The existing historical cottage is a non-conforming being over 27 feet from the property line. Given the required is 40, we felt the further back the new house was from the street, the better it would integrate with the neighborhood and aesthetic and respect that setback, even though it is a grandfathered non-conformity. The Campbell's desire to keep a lot of the existing vegetation on the property as much as possible to again maintain their privacy. There's a series of mature trees and shrubs at the rear of the property, as well as on the eastern and western sides. Again, where the current house is sited, it reduces the impact on these existing vegetations to ma maintain them. When it came to the overall design of the house in the garage, we wanted to feel that it blended with the neighborhood rather than having one larger structure that was for the garage and house, we detach them to create smaller massings and space them out appropriately to impact the site and the neighbors less. There are also two adjacent properties that have detached garages as well. The main house is about 1500 square feet of habitable space, but the second floor steps back four feet or more on each side, reducing the habit habitable space to 783 on the second floor, about half of what the first floor is. The Campbells plan to reside mostly on the first floor as the second floor is intended to be somewhat of a guest suite. We feel we've taken appropriate steps and have done a lot of research and planning to provide the Campbells with a modest home on this property within dimensional setbacks, within the ADE requirements, and hopefully making it a very useful property for many years to come. We'll take any questions that you guys have. Mr. Chairman, do you want us to continue with the presentation or yes, please. Yes, sir. The uh, ADU, ADU, excuse me, bylaw provision uh, is under Section 7, Special Regulations, Section 19. And it directs you uh, to reference the special permit criteria under Section 8C4 of your bylaw. So we will start with that criteria and then I can circle back where there's some specific provisions in the ADU bylaw I just want to touch on as well. But the special permit criteria, of which you are quite familiar, Number one, adequacy of the site in terms of the size for the proposed use. Uh, the size of the site is adequate for the use of a principal dwelling with a detached accessory dwelling unit. The new structures will meet all setbacks and the total lot coverage will be in compliance with the zoning district. There will be sufficient room on the site to allow for these intended uses. Uh, number two, suitability of the site for the proposed use. Uh, we also believe the site is suitable for the proposed use. This is a residential neighborhood and so the creation of an accessory dwelling unit is in line with the requirements of the zoning bylaw. The proposed configuration allows for adequate space and privacy for the residential structures, and there will be adequate parking as required by the bylaw. Number three is impact on traffic flow and safety. Um, there will be no negative impact on tra traffic flow and safety. Both the principal dwelling and the accessory dwelling unit will both utilize the same driveway, and so there will not be a second curb cut onto Barcliffe Avenue. Any additional traffic caused by one or two more cars at the property should be negligible. Mm -hmm. Number four, uh, impact on neighborhood visual character, including views, vistas. Uh, as previously mentioned, and as Caitlin touched on, uh, they spent a great deal of time and gave a great deal of consideration to the impact on the neighboring properties. Um, the setting of the new structure in the middle of the lot not only, not only maintains the view as seen from Barcliff, um, but also tries to minimize the impact on any one neighboring property. Based on um, some feedback that we've received and correspondence that came in today, we know there are a couple neighbors that are in support. Um, uh, number 50 Barcliff and then behind at number 62. Uh, we know there are also a couple of neighbors who are not so uh, supportive of the project. Um, just to touch on the impact on the um, proposal for those particular neighbors, um, the McDonald's at 29 Gladen Way 
Um, Sarah, if you could please pull up the um, uh, the Google Earth image. Thank you very much. So the McDonald property is uh, to the east. So it's that property to the right uh, where the cursor is right now. And um, to the McDonald's credit, they, they reached out early on. Uh, we've met with them a couple of times on site. I know attorney Ford is here today to uh, speak on their behalf. And they've asked um, the Campbells to move the structure closer to um, Barclays. And this is the challenge for the Campbells um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first being the septic system um, and speaking with the engineer, uh, you can't locate it in front of the existing structure. There's not enough room, so it has to go between the structures. Um, you could relocate some of the components to the driveway side and gain a few extra feet forward. Um, the problem with that uh, is you are then coming closer to some other properties, neighboring properties that might not be so supportive of the project if it was to come closer to them. Uh, you're also really squishing together um, the ADU and the proposed principal dwelling such that it, it, again, you're losing some privacy between those two structures as well. And you're also coming closer to Barcliff, which as Caitlin mentioned, we're trying to maintain the streetscape, which is really that cottage in the front and then in the back with the principal dwelling, which is set back quite a distance. If you look at the structure, it's, it's oriented such a way that it really goes between 29, which is the top one on the right, and 50, which is the one below. And so the view is not in directly into that house, but in between those two properties. And the proposed principal dwelling on the Campbell's lot, again, most of it is south of the property at 29, Gladen Way. The, um, we appreciate their privacy concerns. Um, there is a significant distance between the two structures. Our property is, or the proposed house is set back about 27 feet from the lot line. There's also a 20 foot panhandle that services the property and back before you get to the uh, Glen Way property for the McDonald's. So it's about 47 feet in between our structure and their lot line. Um, to try and address the privacy concerns, the McDonald's, excuse me, the Campbells are willing to plant a vegetative buffer, which I relate to attorney four this afternoon in that area of the white circle that you see along the, the property line. And so the goal would be um, Western Arborvitae, I believe, is the species. It'd be about 15 to 20 feet in height, about eight feet wide, and it would provide the necessary privacy, um, we think, to the neighbors. So that was hopefully a way of trying to um, provide an additional buffer um, that would alleviate some of the privacy concerns, again, for the McDonald's. The, um, the other letter I know uh, from a, an abutter that was in opposition is the property at 80 uh, Barcliff, which is to the left. And they referenced um, concerns with massing. Um, you know, I know uh, I have a lot of familiarity with that project because my office was involved with that development. And in terms of massing, it's a little hard to understand because that property, and I'm sure those of you who are on the board in 2017, remember that was two small cottages that were torn down and then the two structures that you see now in this image were, were built. Um, it's a condominium form of ownership, but it's essentially two single family structures on, on one lot. So, I mean, I don't see how our massing is any worse than what's already uh, permitted on the property next door. Uh, number five is adequacy of method of sewage disposal, source of water and drainage. Um, the project includes the installation of a new IA septic system that accommodates four bedrooms both structures on the property will be connected to town water and there will be no issues with drainage caused by the project. I did uh, the letter from Judy Giorgio uh, referencing that currently it is not in compliance with health regulation, board health regulations. That's because the plan has to get filed and approved by the board of health for the IA system that would allow for the fourth bedroom on the property. Also, the um, one of the bedrooms will be removed from the existing structure. So it'll just be a one bedroom uh, accessory dwelling unit and then a three bedroom principal dwelling. Uh, structure. Number six is adequacy of utilities and other public services. Uh, the structures will be connected to all necessary utilities. Uh, number seven, noise and litter. There'll be no issues with noise and litter caused by the proposed project. Number eight, compatibility of the proposed use with surrounding land uses. This is a residential use in a residential neighborhood. 
and therefore it is compatible with the surrounding surrounding land uses. Number nine, impact on the natural environment. Uh, there will be no negative impact on the natural environment as a result of this proposal. And number 10 is not applicable. Uh, now, section 19 of um, section seven, special regulations under your bylaw has some specific provisions um, regarding accessory dwelling unit. And most of them are essentially, uh, you have to meet a, a specific criteria in terms of the size of the accessory dwelling unit for living area. It has to be connected to the same um, septic system as the principal, things of that nature. I mean, the one really, and, and I believe we're, we satisfy all those criteria. The one section that does, the one section that does ask you to, I guess, make more of a subjective determination is that uh, is section C, which references is an AD, the ADU shall be clearly subordinate in use size and design to the principal single family dwelling. And I think we accomplished that. Again, the, the ADU that's proposed is 880 square feet. And then the, um, the principal dwelling is a, has a 1600 square foot uh, footprint. And then the second part of that is an ADU shall be designed so that to the maximum extent practical, the appearance of the, on the, pro of the property on which it is to be located remains that of a single family residential property and the privacy of abutting properties is maintained considering the following and then it cites building architecture, details, roof design, building spacing and orientation, building screening, door and window location and building materials. Um, again, I think we've tried to meet that criteria. I think we have met that criteria. Um, some of the neighbors may disagree, but as you heard, a lot of um, deliberation went into siting, uh, keeping it as far away from the abutting properties as possible by locating in the middle of the lot, maintaining a vegetative barrier um, that currently exists on the site. The um, appearance is to remain that of a single family residential property. I think we do uh, satisfy that criteria. I mean, it's, getting, it's a bit backwards in terms of the smaller structures at the front, but I think that is actually a nice feature for this neighborhood by keeping that uh, streetscape of the of the historic cottage at the property. The second uh, section for our special permit review is the special permit criteria under section VB. Uh, and this again is because of the Bjorkland exception is considered a substantial alteration for the property. As you I'm sure are aware, there's a lot of overlap. So I'll just try to touch on the uh, criteria that are different in this section, if that's okay with the board. Yep, that's a good idea. Okay. Uh, number two uh, is a bit different under this section. It's compatibility of the size of the proposed structure with neighboring properties. Barcliffe Avenue is a street with eclectic house styles and sizes, and the sizes of these homes can be quite, can vary quite a bit in this neighborhood. Uh, we believe the total size of three structures will be compatible with the neighboring properties. Um, in terms of the immediate neighborhood, there have been some recent changes uh, with the construction of new dwellings. I referenced several years ago, the lots to the west of the property, there were um, one really large lot that was subdivided and there were two small cottages on that property in total. Um, it was uh, subdivided such that 76 and 80 are the two I referenced earlier, which were built. And those are similar in size, if not bigger to the proposed new structure on the Campbell's property. And then there's also a house built to the rear at 84 Barcliff, uh, which is a quite uh, large structure in the back there. And then as you look around the neighborhood, you have the homes uh, 50, you have the home in back at 62. There are a couple of the lots on Gladen Way that are, are in the vicinity. And I think, again, the, the proposed structures are compatible with the size of structures that you see in this area. Uh, number three, extent of the proposed increase in non-conforming nature of the structure or use. The proposed new dwelling in the garage meets all dimensional requirements of the bylaw and the new garage will actually be more non-conforming as the current garage encroaches on the setback. Um, the only non-conformities remaining will be the street and easterly setback for the existing structure that's going to remain in its current location. Let's see. Um, suitability of the site, including but not limited to impact on neighboring properties or on the natural environment. Um, the site is very level, so there'll be no, and there are no wetlands located on the property or adjacent to the property. Accordingly, there'll be no negative impact on neighboring properties as a result of the construction. And other than that, the rest of that criteria under section VB essentially mirrors the criteria that we reviewed under um, section eight. Okay. 
so with, um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I think that would be our, our presentation. Um, we're happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Very good. Uh, thank you. Uh, at this point, I would ask for anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of these applications to indicate on the screen now that you would like to speak so that Sarah can recognize you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Heather has her hand raised. Okay. So she would like to speak. Okay. Hi, I'm using my phone because I can't get my video camera or my um, the audio working. Okay, Heather, could you identify yourself, please? My name is Heather McKenzie, and I'm the owner of 64, uh, 62 Barcliff Avenue. Okay, very good. Okay, please. Um, my brother, Cameron, I'm hearing a, a, an echo, I'm sorry. My brother, Cameron McKenzie, and my mother, Elizabeth McKenzie, also are owners of 62 Barcliff Avenue. We were the previous owners of 64, the original uh, carriage house, which is in the front, which is the property that the Campbells now own. And um, we are interested in preserving the original carriage house as part of Chatham history. There's a lot of um, people raising the old buildings, and we, we are in favor of uh, the, the new building. And we, we appreciate the fact that the Campbells want to preserve the history of the carriage house, which is now the only part of the old Eldridge farmhouse. Which, which stood there originally. And um, we like the, the new building. We have no objections to uh, the, the new plan. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor of these applications? Please indicate in the screen now so that Sarah can recognize you. I am not seeing anyone else that wishes to speak in favor of this application. Okay, then uh, Sarah and I will uh, share reading of the correspondence. First of all, we have a memo. This is from Judith Giorgio, health agent for the town. She writes on 4-8, I have reviewed the plan to demo and rebuild the dwelling. Our records indicate that there is an existing two-bedroom dwelling. The proposal appears to add a three-bedroom dwelling and reduce the existing dwelling to one bedroom for a total of four. This is not allowed by the Board of Health nitrogen loading regulation. Approval by the Board of Health will be required. And then we have a uh, letter. This is from Michael Waters. It was received at the Department of Community Development on April 2nd. <clears throat> Mr. Waters writes, my house at 40 Gladden Lane is one of four houses on a quiet street, most of which have been owned by my neighbors for over 20 years. In that regard, when considering applicants' requests for a special permit, the ZBA is required to consider the quote-unquote impact on that neighborhood visual character, including views and vistas, end of quote and may only grant the permit based on a finding that will not be detrimental to the neighborhood. As is set forth in the opposition of Ted McDonald of 29 Gladden Lane, the proposed use will burden his property and the neighborhood by erecting a 30-foot high building close to and overshadowing his house. I join in his opposition. The applicant proposes construction of a new house in conjunction with a separate alternate dwelling unit. The requirements for an ADU have not been met and the application should be denied unless revised to comply. Section 7B194C of the special regulation requires that an ADU should be designed so that, to the maximum extent practical, the appearance on the property on which it is to be located remains that of a single-family residential property and the privacy of abutting properties be maintained. The regulation requires that the ZBA make written findings certifying compliance with the specific requirements governing, governing individual special uses. Section 8.4 uh, 
it is clear that the appearance of the proposed development is that of two separate houses about 75 feet apart and located on a lot that could not be subdivided to allow such construction. Many of the ADUs subject to amnesty were apartments built around a two-car garage. Here, applicant proposes to build a new 552-square-foot detached garage with the addition of a second story and a few adjustments it could easily become the one-bedroom ADU sought and both the garage and the new house could be built 35 feet closer to Barcliffe and not be on top of the McDonald property. And then we have a letter dated April 6th. This is from Edward and Catherine McDonald. And I believe they are in the audience. Uh, are you planning on presenting this yourself when we come to uh, folks who wish to speak against or would you like me to read the whole letter? We just don't want duplication. That's why I asked the question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Mr. McDonald. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is um, Ed McDonald, and I'm the um, son of uh, Ted and Kathy McDonald, who live at 29 Gladden Lane. I I'm more than happy to have you uh, read the, the letter, Mr. Chairman, but um, if, it's, um, if it pleases you and the board, um, I'm more than happy to uh, wait and then just simply highlight uh, a couple of the, um, the sections. I recognize it's a, a lengthy letter. Mm -hmm. Okay, well... Uh... Thank you, but I'm, I'm sort of obligated to read the whole thing, so uh, I will do that, but I appreciate the effort, okay? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Part. Thank you. Sometimes we have folks who want to present the whole letter, and that makes it repetitious. Okay, um, this was written, on, as I said, on April 6th. It's from Edward and Catherine McDonald, 29 Gladden Lane. They write, <clears throat> uh, we're writing in regard to the ZBA application for the property located at 64 Barcliffe Avenue. Provide my thoughts on their plans for the property which abuts my own at 29 Gladden Lane. My wife and I, a retired couple, have owned our property since 1991 and have lived here in Chatham as full-time residents for nearly 20 years. We value the level of privacy that the location and the siting of our home currently provides us. We understand that the proponents have submitted an application for a special permit to the Chatham ZBA and that they are asking for zoning relief on several aspects of their construction proposal. Specifically, they are proposing to convert the existing historical cottage into an ADU, and are requesting relief on all three of the following criteria of the Chatham Protective Zoning Bylaws. Number one, detached structure. Conversion of existing detached 890 square foot historical cottage built in 1890. Number two, property is pre-existing non-conforming. A lot is non-conforming, is their answer. Uh, number three, ADU will not comply with conventional requirements. They state existing cottage slash proposed ADU is set back from street only 27.7 feet as opposed to the required 40 feet. Although the existing cottage at 890 square feet is just under the 900 square foot maximum limit for consideration as an ADU and complies with the bylaws governing ADUs in that regard, it currently consists of two bedrooms, one of which would need to be removed to fully comply with the bylaws. Given that fact, I would argue <coughs> that it is already the primary residential structure on the property and as such should not be considered appropriate conversion to an ADU. In addition to relief on the proposed cottage conversion slash ADU, the proponents are also proposing to build two new structures on the property, including a two-story, three-bedroom dwelling and a detached two-car garage with a second-floor loft space. While the two structures comply with all zoning setback, height and lot coverage requirements, taken together, they are deemed a substantial alteration to the non-conforming lot, which is an additional request that also requires a special permit per the second exempt clause of the Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 6 and 9. The nature of the overall special permit request seems reasonable at face value, but upon further review should be considered inappropriate as it relates to the overall context of the neighborhood and the proximity of the new construction to abutters to the northeast, north, and west of the pro uh, subject property. We would like to cite Section 7B, 19.4C of the Chatham Perfected Bylaws, which reads, an ADU shall be designed so that, to the maximum extent practical, the appearance of the property on which it is to be located remains that of a single family residential property, and the privacy of abutting properties is maintained considering the following. 
building architectural details, roof design, building spacing and orientation, building screening, door and window location, and building materials. We feel strongly that the proposal does not comply with either of these zoning clauses, in particular the structures, one existing and two new, appear as two distinct single family residential structures separated by 75 feet, and not that of a single primary residence with a small ADU addition or semi-attached structure. The 31,000 square foot lot is simply not large enough to spatially and visually accommodate the combined density of the two dwelling structures along with a new detached garage. Moreover, the privacy of the abiding properties, properties, particularly to the Northeast and North is not maintained. Specifically, we object to the siting and orientation of the proposed new dwelling structure. The North section of the new dwelling structure where the main living spaces are located, including the kitchen, dining room, main outdoor patio and second floor deck encroaches significantly across the Northern privacy barrier identified in the graphic overlay of the site plan dated February 2, 2021, and prepared by O'Reilly and Associates. The footprint of the new structure extends approximately 16 feet over the privacy barrier slash southern edge of our, of our dwelling structure, with a first floor patio extending an additional 14 feet, such that the overall encroachment across the privacy barrier slash southern edge of our dwelling structure is on the order of approximately 30 feet. As a result of the encroachment, large roof trees that currently provide a visual buffer between the existing cottage slash garage and our home would be removed to accommodate the new 30 foot high structure. Significantly and significantly compromising the limited privacy we currently enjoy. For section 8C4 of the China Perspective Bylaws, the Zoning Board of Appeals is responsible for evaluating the suitability of special permits using criteria that include adequacy of the site in terms of size for the proposed use and impact of neighborhood visual character, including vistas and views. It is clear that the proponents are seeking to establish two distinct single family dwelling structures on a lot that is not legally large enough to subdivide accordingly. That is 31,000 square feet versus 40,000 square feet required to subdivide into two 20,000 square foot lots. We feel strongly that the proposed siting and orientation of the new structures, as well as the removal of the existing natural buffer, adversely affects our privacy and access to the natural light and breezes. We cite the relevant sections of the Chatham Zoning Bylaws to impress upon the ZBA the significance of the re relief being sought through the special permit. In return for the board's consideration of that significant relief on behalf of the proponent, we would request that the board require the proponent to modify their plans by relocating the new structure 50 feet south towards Barcliffe Avenue in order to maintain as much of the existing natural buffer as possible and to minimize the visual and environmental impact to our property, as well as the properties of the abutters to the north and west. We feel this is a reasonable request in light of the significant zoning relief sought by the proponent. Thank you for your consideration. Again, that is from Edward and Catherine McDonald. Okay, so I have uh, another letter. <clears throat> this is, I believe it was a memo. Anyway, it is from Stephen and Penelope Rutledge and they're at 76 Barcliffe Avenue. We are the owners of the property known as 76 Barcliffe Avenue and our property of about 64. We received a notice and so on and so forth. Based on our review of the proposed modifications to the existing structure and the construction of two new structures depicted on the plans for 64, we respectfully submit our concerns and questions relative to altering the town of Chatham zoning bylaws to accommodate these proposed changes to the property. Please note our concerns and questions are based solely on parcel density potential to have more bedrooms than allowed as well as two separate kitchens and are by no means intended to attack the design of the new dwelling or the current owner's interest to upgrade their property. Additionally, please excuse the absence of our intimate knowledge of the town of Chatham zoning bylaws as well as the zoning by a board of appeals process for evaluating such requests since we are only homeowners and do not wish to engage legal counsel for this matter. Please also note that the context of our concerns and questions are basically solely on our experience and knowledge gained while looking for property in Chatham over the past 10 plus years and may be a product of misinformation. Number one, the existing dwelling is currently a two bedroom cottage as it sits today. A, how does the town of Chatham by right accept the modification of this existing dwelling to become a one bedroom 
with an office simply by the plans, removing the door and changing the name of our room from a bedroom to an office. B, based on the current concept proposed by the owners of 64, it has been represented by a written correspondence that this dwelling will be used as a rental property. If that is the case, how does the town of Chatham ensure that the existing dwelling does not revert back to being rented as a two bedroom rental dwelling by the current owners, or for that matter, the future owners of the property? How will this be policed and controlled by the town of Chatham going forward. Obviously, if the existing dwelling was to be used as a two bedroom unit, the overall property would then need to be considered a five bedroom parcel, which is not allowed under the Chatham zoning bylaws. Is this a correct interpretation? Question mark. If the existing structure was to be used as a two bedroom dwelling in conjunction with a proposed new three bedroom dwelling, wouldn't that severely compromise the proposed septic system since the septic system is only allowed to be designed to support four bedrooms based upon the parcel square footage? Number two, one of the two new structures proposed for the parcel is a two car garage with a set of stairs to the upper level. Consistent with the concerns expressed in number one, how does the town of Chatham prevent this area above the garage from becoming occupiable space since the stairs, stairs imply that there is a long term intent to build this space out? If it was to be built out as an office with a bathroom, then it could easily be transformed into a bedroom, which would ultimately make the parcel a six bedroom property, which is not allowed under the zoning bylaws. It would also significantly compromise the septic system, which can only be designed to support four bedrooms on the parcel. Is this a correct interpretation? Number three, based on <clears throat> the knowledge we gained while considering purchasing other properties, over the years, it's been our understanding that in order for a lot parcel to have two kitchens on the property, the lot parcel has to have sufficient square footage and in turn, it has to also be recorded and deeded as a condominium, which on the surface, it would appear 64 cannot meet either of these standards. Is this a correct interpretation? Concerning the way the modifications of the parcel being proposed and the more specifically the way the property A is currently a non-conforming lot and the proposed modifications will compound the non-conformity lot and B could easily be transitioned and become six bedrooms, which we understand is not allowed as by the law, uh, zoning bylaws it's currently written. And D, if the town of Chatham zoning bylaws were to grant approval as currently proposed, there could be a major long-term issues associated with the septic system, which only can be designed for four bedrooms based on the parcel square footage, but would ultimately fail due to the septic system being taxed with up to five, six bedrooms contributing to it. We respectfully request that the Zoning Board of Appeals evaluate the above questions when considering the appeal and to extent it is appropriate, provide the corresponding answers to the abutters accordingly. Alternately, if the board is so inclined to grant the request to modify the zoning bylaws to the extent it is appropriate, please provide an affirmative answer to the question of how the town of Chatham will ensure that under no circumstances will the property morph into a five or six bedroom property after it is initially constructed or say over the next 10, 20 or 30 years or until the zoning current bylaws are amended accordingly. Thank you for the opportunity to provide input and express our concerns relative to the requested modification. Uh, unfortunately, due to previous commitments, we're unable to participate in the April uh, 8th meeting, but are more than willing to make ourselves available at a future point in time to discuss the matter if the board so desires. Thank you again. Again, that was Stephen and Penelope Rutledge. All right, Sarah, I believe you have three letters uh, to read. I do. Our first one is from Trudy Greg and Andrew Bulkley. We are immediate neighbors of Tom and Susan Campbell. We fully support their proposal made in application number 21-017 and wish them well in their endeavor. And they are located at 50 Barcliffe Avenue. Our next letter is from Elizabeth McKenzie, 62 Barcliffe Avenue received today. And it says, Dear Thomas and Susan, thank you for the house plan. I think it is more attractive and well placed. All the best on the seventh, Liz. And our final letter is from Thomas and Linda Leinbach, 80 Barcliff Ave, received today. To the members of the Chatham Zoning Board of Appeals, I am writing on behalf of my wife and myself, Linda and Thomas, owners of 80 Barcliff Avenue and abutters to the adjacent property at 64 Barcliff Avenue. We are of two minds on the subject. When I first met Tom Campbell in the fall of 2019, just after he 
and his wife had purchased the property at 64 Barcliffe Avenue, he informed me that at some point after he and his wife retired, they would like to build a new home on the property. I falsely assumed they would be removing the existing structure in order to accommodate the new home. As such, I thought nothing of it. In general, we support the idea that homeowners are entitled to do as they wish with their property, with obvious limits, of course. Upon receiving notification from the ZBA in a letter dated March 18th, we were struck by the Campbell's proposal to keep the existing home with modifications, tear down the existing garage, and replace it with a larger two-story one, in addition to the construction of a new larger home. While we wholeheartedly support the Campbell's wish to build a new home, we have concerns about density. Rather than two structures, the property will now feature three, in addition to the two proposed new builds. In addition, the two proposed new builds appear to be quite a bit higher and larger than those currently in place. Thus, with two larger and higher structures condensed into a relatively small footprint in combination with the existing home, the proposed plan would feature, as I say, all of the, all of, all three structures in total, rendering the property we fear tightly bound and overcrowded, with the potential to com compromise the character of the property as well as the neighborhood. In speaking with our neighbors at 76 Barcliffe Avenue, Stephen and Penelope Rutledge, we share their concerns expressed in their response to the March 18th ZBA letter about the number of potential bedrooms and bathrooms, as well as the uncertainty regarding the town's oversight and governance of the rental provisions on the property, both now and in the future. It is also our understanding that the existing home does not meet zoning code, though it, though it is no doubt grandfathered, but with the proposed renovation, including the construction of a new home, we are not certain why it is necessary or advisable to keep the current home in place. Furthermore, with the existing home removed, there would be more space to locate the new home and garage in locations that likely would satisfy at least one of the other abutters' concerns, Ted McDonald. Both Linda and I welcome the Campbells into the neighborhood and wish them a long and happy life here on Barcliffe Avenue. We just wish they would reconsider the need to keep the existing home in place. And that would be the extent of the correspondence. <clears throat> okay. So at this point, I'm going to ask for anyone in the audience who wishes to speak either against this appeal or has a specific question to uh, indicate on the screen. And so I think I'll start with you, Mr. McDonald, uh, because you wanted to do it a little early, right? I do believe. So are you still with us? Oh, I am, yes. Okay. Uh, if you just give us your name and uh, then go for, forth with that. Sure. Um, my name is Ed McDonald. Um, I live in uh, live in Charlestown, Mass, uh, in Boston, uh, and I'm the, the son of uh, Ted and Kathy McDonald, who live at uh, 29 Gladden Lane. I appreciate, uh, Mr. Chairman, that you you know reading the letter. I understand it was kind of a lengthy letter. Uh, it cited a lot of uh, zoning uh, zoning sections as well. Um, let me first say that uh, you know my parents are um, are in support of Campbell's uh, desire to create a home for themselves uh, in Chatham. We we recognize that uh, you know they have the right to uh, to build a home on that site. Uh, some of the specific concerns that um, that my parents had were simply the siting and orientation of the home, uh, the, in particular the new structure um, and. Um, let me just say for, for the record that uh, I'm actually a trained architect myself. Um, I work in real estate in Boston. Um, so I'm, I'm just familiar with kind of, you know, building codes and uh, zoning as well. So I assisted them in kind of the um, assessment um, of, of the campus proposal. Um, and, um, and I just simply wanted to say that, uh, you know, I do, um, I do think that the, um, uh, the desire to actually uh, maintain the existing historic cottages is really commendable. Um, I also think that um, you know the actual architecture uh, of the the proposed new home uh, is um, is very um, is very clever in that it sets back, as the architect stated, on the second floor. Um, I would say that um, the actual location and siting is really what's um, what's at stake here, um, and what's uh, most concerned of my parents. Um, there is um, there was a 
a graphic, a, a document that uh, the Campbells shared with my parents that that showed kind of a, a dashed line that represented a, uh, what they were show, calling a privacy barrier, both a northern privacy barrier and a southern privacy barrier. Um, and I, you know, I have that document in front of me. Essentially, it's um, without actually showing it on the screen. It essentially um, uh, prescribes kind of an area um, on their property. Which, uh, which would not uh, encroach either to the north or to the south um, to, to violate kind of privacy areas of their respective abutters. Um, and it's, it, they are actually um, to the northern side there, they're encroaching or they're crossing that, that imaginary line, I should say, the privacy barrier, you know, probably about, about uh, 16 feet with the, the main bulk of the home. And then of course the patio, uh, an additional 14 feet and um, I understand that Mr. Norcross, you know, indicated that he would be screening the private, the the property from uh, my parents' home. So I, I appreciate that effort. I think that's less of um, less of a concern, or we feel as though what would be um, a better solution would be for the the home and the garage to to actually be um, relocated closer to Barclay Avenue. Uh, I understand the letter stated 50 feet. Um, given kind of what they're uh, attempting to do with a, a buffer between the existing cottage and the new structures, uh, as well as the, the siting of the septic uh, system that may not be possible. However, um, we think that um, personally, I think that it could be uh, slid forward without any change to the design of the house or the garage um, by at least uh, 15 to 20 feet. Um, it may require uh, the relocation of the septic um, to either the back of the lot or, as Mr. Norcross had said, um, to the west side of the uh, of the lot. Um, I think one of the other things that's important to note here is that by they did uh, indicate that they wanted to maintain as much of the natural buffer uh, as currently exists, and and we appreciate that. I think by sliding the home. Uh, towards Bar Barcliff Avenue, it would achieve um, two goals. One would be uh, to make the, the property actually uh, more condensed, um, the footprint of the property more condensed on the lot, um, which counter kind of what their architects said, I think would actually make it appear more uh, as one, one larger structure. Uh, even though that may, you know, there may be some who, who believe that's not desirable. Uh, as opposed to kind of stretching out the the footprints across across the lot more. The second is it would uh, allow for um, some of the large growth mature trees that are um, currently in that area uh, where the new house would be sited to to potentially be salvaged, which would be uh, something I think of interest to to my parents as well. Um, I think that you know it's a reasonable request to have them reconsider kind of the the siting of it in light of the fact that they're you know they are requesting some substantial relief on the part of the zoning, uh, particularly with respect to the ADU. And I know some of the other abutters have, um, you know, have, have, have mentioned that as well. Um, you know, I, I understand what they're trying to do. I appreciate it. I think, um, as I said, it's commendable to to uh, to try to maintain the historical cottage. It's a, it's a lovely little uh, carriage house, as Elizabeth had mentioned. Um, I wonder if there's a way that we can, you know, kind of achieve some kind of middle ground here um, and I'd be more than happy to work with uh, the Campbells and their architect to uh, to to find a, a solution that's appropriate. Um, I do think that the <laughs> it is a little um, a little strange uh, the way they're going about the the ADU, which I know is a um, is a new bylaw uh, just passed in 2019. Um, but um, one of the other abutters had cited the fact that um, many of the others um, that had been given amnesty were really kind of either. Uh, spaces above a garage or uh, small uh, in-law units that were already attached to a, a dwelling. I, I think what's happening here is you have three distinct structures um, on a lot that's you know maybe a, a little narrow, uh, difficult to accommodate that. So um, the difference um, the difference between that and the lot I believe adjacent just to the west is, and I I don't know this for a fact is, but they probably did a condo. Uh, situation there. I, I don't know if that lot is 40,000 square feet and it was subdivided, but you know, this lot is just, just slightly less than the 40,000 that would be required to, um, to site two primary residences on, uh, through a subdivision. So I, I understand what they're trying to do. I, I feel as though maybe there's a, a solution here that could work that would not 
really adversely impact what they're what they're proposing to do, um, but would actually potentially actually improve it uh, if the home and garage were were moved closer to Barcliff or somehow um, you know oriented just uh, slightly differently. Um, it may actually be an improvement. I will one last comment is um, I do I do remember Nor uh, Mr. Norcross indicating that he there was a desire to create a buffer. Uh, a natural buffer uh, screen between the existing cottage and the uh, and the new structures, and I don't know. I, he termed it as a privacy uh, screen, so I don't know if that was an intention to kind of uh, mask the the new house from the the streetscape, which could be seen as being positive, or if it's really an intent to uh, to physically separate two distinct structures, which really when you're looking at it kind of seem to be primary structures um, despite the size of the of the cottage so I think in, in light of kind of what they're requesting it you know I think there's there's definitely a solution here that I think um, would be some a middle ground that would not require them to substantially change the design of the house uh, but but it would just the orientation maybe location um, I believe that's it yeah all right thank you very much thank you. Yeah, thank All you right. very much for hearing me. Anyone else out there who would like to speak either against this appeal or has a specific question? If so, please indicate now on the screen so that Sarah can recognize you. I don't see anyone with their hand raised or waving at me on the screen, so. Okay, so I think uh, before we go to uh, questions from the board, Mr. Norcross, um, would you like some time for rebuttal uh, from not only what uh, the McDonald's have had to say, but also <clears throat> the other notes, including the one from um, the uh, Rutledge, Stephen and Penelope, because they raised a number of questions. So, uh, the floor is yours if you'd like it. Sure, uh, I would, Mr. Chairman. Um, in terms of the Rutledge's questions, uh, which focused on the, the bedroom count for the property, um, as I stated, there's currently two bedrooms in the existing cottage. Um, the interior would be renovated such that it would become a one-bedroom structure. How is this governed by the town? Well, you don't get a certificate of occupancy for the new building until the town's confirmed that the front structure, the cottage, has been modified accordingly, so that it is strictly a one-bedroom. Uh, there is space above the um, proposed garage. This could be finished. Um, I guess you you sort of see this fairly commonly in projects in town, uh, sort of a bonus room. It could be office space. You know, again, that's going to get reviewed as part of any certificate of occupancy to ensure that at the time it's built, it's not used as a bedroom. How is that regulated going forward? Well, it's the same as any other property in town. You know, there's not bedroom inspections that take place by the building department. I guess there's just a, a, a theory and, and a good theory that folks are going to do the right thing. And for the most part, they do. Um, in terms of trying to squeeze an extra bedroom out of the front structure, I think one of the beauties of the ADU provision is that the Campbells have to live at this property full time. So they're not going to try to maximize a rental property when they are also um, going to be at the property uh, on a daily basis. Um, referencing um, Mr. Waters' letter, who is at 40 Glen Lane, you know, he's quite a distance away. I don't think he can really even see our property. It seemed like he's more concerned with, uh, on behalf of McDonald's, which is fine. And, and then <clears throat> moving along to concerns of McDonald's. And I think, again, I, I think, you know, the Campbell share want the same thing in terms of an outcome with McDonald's. They want privacy. They want it to look nice. They want it to be a congenial neighborhood. I think we just differ in terms of whether or not the structure as proposed is impacting privacy. Um, you know, a couple of things that were stated about ADU size and it's supposed to be smaller than what's proposed. Well, this is what the bylaw says. It's 900 square feet or less. I don't think there's any requirement that it has to be a room above a garage. I don't think that was the intent uh, when this was created by, uh, by the town. I think the intent was to create nice housing that was affordable for the year-round population in Chatham. Um, when I mentioned privacy between the two structures, I wasn't referring to vegetative privacy between the proposed and the cottage. I was referring to privacy um, in terms of maintaining the vegetation 
between the abutters. That would be between the McDonald property, between 50 Barcliff, and between the properties to the west at 76 and 80 Barcliff. Um, Caitlin, could I just ask you to, to go through um, this rendering a bit, just showing the, the property and explaining the design from uh, as viewed from 29 Gladen Lane? Yes, absolutely. Um, the PDF that you're looking at right now, the top perspective is from Gladden Lane. Um, so the windows are in opposite directions and the corner of the house is actually pointing to their house. If Sarah, if you can pull up the um, Google Earth image overlay. Thank you. Um, so the house that we're speaking of, the, the abutters, is right at the top, northern. There we go. Perfect. Um, the circle or oval that's kind of to the left of that is a natural opening that's already happening on the property, but it's also right in between that directional view from the house to the McDonald's house. That is where we're proposing uh, putting six Western uh, varieties there. Um, which are pretty dense evergreens. Um, they grow to be about 15 to 20 feet tall, which would cover and hide from the second floor. It would prevent any views into the McDonald's area. Um, so it would kind of close off that opening between these two existing um, plant planting areas, which are with mature trees and uh, shrubbery as well. So that is where we were thinking that this could be a fair compromise um, between instead of moving the house forward where we think it's actually detrimental to the, the property and the ADU and moving the septic. Um, I know there was a comment also about moving the septic to the rear of the property. Um, we want to potentially connect to the future sewer that comes down the street. And the reason why we want to have the septic closer to the front of the property is that we can make that happen when that becomes available. So putting it into the rear of the property would be very difficult to do so, but also um, we have to connect the ADU to the septic system as well. It cannot be on a separate septic system. Um, so running a septic all the way to the back of the property and connecting the ADU would also be quite challenging as well. Jamie, do you want me to speak anything more on that? No, thank you, Caitlin. Um, Sarah, if you could just pull up the rendering for me uh, quickly, please. Thank you very much. Um, so again, really the only sections that are, uh, look, this would be the section again facing 29 Gladen. And so the first floor, um, it's gonna be a heavy vegetative buffer on our property. There are, is already a heavy vegetative buffer on the McDonald property. There's probably about 12 <laughs> foot high um, arborvitaes that run along the property line. There are There is a second story, you have the two windows in the back uh, for the bedrooms. But again, most of the focus is on the other side of this property that faces 80 and 76. That's where the front door is. There's more windows over there. Um, there is the roof deck space here that you see. Um, you know, I think, again, this is where the vegetation comes in and providing that buffer. In terms of a distance, I think I mentioned it before, uh, this structure is over 45 feet from the McDonald lot line and about 65 feet from their property line, excuse me, from their home. Um, their home actually is located within the setback. It's only about 17 feet from the lot line. So again, we're meeting the setback requirements. And then you also have that 20 foot panhandle as part of 62 that provides additional buffer in between the two properties. So the Campbells want to be good neighbors. They just think this proposal is reasonable. It's not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, again, you'd say, why can't you just move it up closer to Barcliff, as we've mentioned for the septic and for Again, streetscape reasons, um, it, it just doesn't really work for the project to move it any closer to Barcliff uh, from the proposed location uh, as part of today's proposal. So uh, with that, we appreciate the board's time and, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. We'll now have questions from the board. We'll start with Dave Veach. <clears throat> Thanks, Dave. Um, well, I guess, uh, first of all, um, um, this is just a kind of a housekeeping matter. I think I understand this, but I just want to point this out. Uh, Caitlin, um, on, <clears throat> I noticed on um, my elevations, and, and um, this page is not numbered, so, uh, but I will say the, it's the elevations as the front elevation with the garage is the title. 
And then I also noticed on the rendering that we just saw of the view from 20, uh, Clayton Lane. Um, I, and, I, and I think there's just a, 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 an error that you're, you're showing a gable on the eastern facing side of the garage, uh, whereas that doesn't show in the roof plan or the other elevation. So I just want to clarify um, so uh, that, that, that gave, that's, that's, a, that's a couple of extra lines that got into the drawing that don't belong there. Is that true? Yes. Okay. So, okay, good. So there is no gable facing on the garage, no gable facing the east side there. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood that. Yes. Um, so we have also been in design development of the house since we've submitted the drawings. Um, there is a gable to be on the back of the of the garage. So it is a cross, a true cross gable. Okay. Okay. So that is because it doesn't show on all the drawings that we got. So mm -hmm. that's why I wanted to clarify that you are proposing that gable uh, as well. Okay. Yes, I apologize. That was been a recent change. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, I don't, Dave, I don't think I have any other questions at this point. There's a lot spinning around in my mind, but not questions that I can put. Okay, okay. So uh, we'll continue with questions from the board. Paul. Uh, I agree with uh, with Dave Veach. I don't really have any questions, I think, at this point. Um, it's more a matter of digesting what we have for information. Okay. All right. Questions from Buck. I'll say the same thing. No questions. Questions from Dave Thompson. Uh, Dave Thompson does not have any questions at this time. Thank you. Uh, questions from Dennis. Yeah, um, Dennis Selby. I have a couple of questions from the McDonald's. Um, they've mentioned on several occasions that they're talking about moving the house and moving the garage forward. And uh, just, uh, how many feet are we talking about here? Maybe their son could answer it. Uh -huh. Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm here, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I can speak. Go ahead. I think if um, I, I can actually um, speak to that and say it's. I think that we're we're looking for them to to move the house. It would be nice for them to move the house south towards Barclay, um, up uh, about thirty feet, twenty to thirty feet. So it's you know it's really it's really something that I think could be accommodated, given um, given the uh, the way that it's currently laid out. I don't. I don't know what the resistance is to that. If you could actually probably move it at least 15 to 20 feet without compromising the, um, the septic, but um, that's just speculation on my part. I don't, uh, you know, I haven't surveyed the land. I don't know the the distances. Um, so, are you talking about keeping keeping the same perspective between the house and the garage, or moving the garage closer to the house? Or the house closer to the garage. I think the I think the best solution would to keep the uh, relationship between the house and the garage as it is, and move it move it 15 to 20 feet south. If that's not um, feasible given the layout of the the septic, potentially you know you could potentially move the septic if necessary, um, slightly adjusted, or uh, alternatively. Uh, have the garage and the house uh, be moved closer to each other. Um, I, I think the creation of the separation um, showing three distinct structures on the lot is, I think is kind of problematic, although I, I understand that the architect is seeing that as a, a solution to uh, density. I think I think density closer to Barcliffe would be welcomed, uh, especially density that would you know, um, convey to uh, the town and then the abutters that you're you really have one one larger structure. I think that would be that would be sufficient for us. Um, it's it's really basically moving it just south of the um, what they call the privacy barrier line, which was um, which was on a diagram that they had shown us. I actually have it. I'm happy to share that uh, on screen if necessary. Um, so that it's clearer. Okay, so you're not you're not talking about impacting or or 
going into the leach fields or anything like that. No, I, I I'm not suggesting that. I think what you would do is um, if I if I looked at the site plan correctly and the the setback lines are not shown here on this plan, but uh, you could actually slide the house south slightly south southwest, basically uh, towards Barcliff. Uh, 15 to 20 feet, and um, you could achieve two goals. One is to kind of make the the compound seem more uh, one one primary residence that has components to it, as opposed to two or even three distinct kind of structures here. And the second would be to preserve, to the extent possible, um, some of the the large growth natural vegetation that exists on the um, on the northeast side of the site that uh, between 29 Gladden Lane and, and this site. Um, I think short of actually, you know, kind of putting pen to paper here or <laughs> showing you a diagram, it uh, might be difficult to see, but I think that you could you could move the front of the house that's facing Barcliff to the location where the edge of the, the garage is now uh, and then shift the garage down accordingly if necessary or if that's desirable to keep them two separate structures. Um, and and still maintain the uh, and I believe you can still maintain the um, uh, uh, keep the septic system you know where it's located. Um, I think any kind of a relief in that way would be seen as a positive. Um, you know I think the the more the better. But as I said, I think it would actually help help the siting unless unless the real desire here is to to have distinct separation between what they're going to be using as a rental unit and their and their home. Um, and I understand that too. Um, I, I still think you can achieve that with, you know, with a natural buffer between the two. Uh, it's just be a tighter relationship. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, Dennis? No, I have no other questions. Okay, Megan, questions? I have no questions at this time. Okay, Bill, do you have any questions? I do. Uh, and this, you know, for the applicant, and I think some something along the lines of what Mr. McDonald was talking about. Did you evaluate any? Did you evaluate the back of the site for a septic system, as opposed to where you put it? And I don't have that plan with the details of the septic system, so I can't, you know, speak to the how much you perked or if you perked somewhere else or whatever. But did you look at other areas? The uh, they did with their engineer. Um, you know, in terms of you could potentially put it in the rear. He said you'd probably need a pump in order to get it all the way to the front house from way from that distance. Um, it also is problematic when you have to connect the sewer later on. The um, just to address the the moving up 20 feet um, option. And speaking with John O'Reilly yesterday again, he said it's not just touching on the leach field. There's obviously setbacks that are involved as well from the leach field and from the lot lines for the foundation and the structure. So there's a lot goes into it. And he said, you know, you might be able to put some components on the west side and gain a few feet, but there's no way you're going to get, you know, anything like 20 feet to the south and be able to maintain the septic on the on the front part of the of the lot. Um, well, I mean, arguably, you do pick up a little bit of width as you move to the front of the site. That's why, you know, I just that that doesn't hurt you if you could push things a little bit forward. Also. You know, when I looked at the property, I just had a question about the landscaping uh, and the trees that would be removed. Have you done any kind of a uh, preliminary even grading analysis or plan of the property to determine how much of that back of that property you'd have to clear in order to meet this plan? Caitlin, would you be able to address that for us? Hi, this is Caitlin. Um, we have not done the rear property where the major set of trees are. The ones that are close to the cottage is what we originally did because we thought we would be doing something closer to the existing cottage when we started our research. So when we did the existing plot plan with John O'Reilly, we just had him source and locate um, the immediate vegetation to the existing cottage because we weren't quite sure exactly what we were doing. So yes, there is plans to get the remaining trees and vegetation marked on the site plan at a later date to determine exactly what needs to come down. Um, but a majority of it in the very rear will be staying. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I don't have any and other Caitlin, questions. Okay. And Caitlin, um, I believe the goal is all. Oh, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Um, no, go ahead. In terms of the veg, in terms of the vegetation near the proposed house, Caitlin, can you just touch on how much of that will be remaining? Yes. So as the. Best as you can. <laughs> So on the eastern side of the lot, there is a huge, um, where the hand is currently, there's a quite a bit of shrubbery at that point. We'll try to keep and maintain as much as we can and not try to overdig too much for the foundation of the new house. And then there's still a little bit more too south of that hand shown on the plan of also areas that would remain as well. We might have to clip a little bit of that to get the garage in, but a majority of that will remain as well along that road can handle that Jamie's referred to. On the other side, the western side of the property, um, there's an existing hedge um, that I believe is actually installed when the new houses on the um, west side were, in, um, were constructed that is there, and that will also exist and remain. And then there's a couple larger trees on the western side towards the northern piece of the property that will remain. And then you can kind of see um, right past the building, there's an opening and a break. And then all the trees in the back of the property should remain as well. Um, and again, another issue with moving the septic to the rear of the property is we would most likely have to be demoing some of those trees to install the septic as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bill, did you have any other questions? I did not, thanks. Okay, uh, Caitlin, I had a question. Uh, uh, I believe the existing cottage, the ridge is 14 or 15 feet, is that correct? I believe you are correct in that. Okay, so what's the ridge on the new garage and the new house going to be in relation to that? On the new house, we are, um, the top railing of the widow's walk is at 30 feet and the um, top of deck is at 27 feet. So solid house is up to 27 feet high. Okay, and the party deck or widow's walk, whatever you want to call it, is an extra three feet. How about the garage? And the garage, I believe, is half that. Um, let me just look at my notes. And I can tell you in one quick second. Hold on. I believe that is around 22 feet. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so um, I'm gonna circle back to Dave Veach, Paul Buck. Did you folks uh, come up with a question in the interim or are you all set to go into deliberations? Uh, it's Dave Veach, um, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable going into deliberations. Dave. Okay, Paul. Yes, Paul Semple, I agree. Okay, Buck. No, I'm comfortable going into deliberations. This is Buck. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, Paul, may we have a motion, please? Yes, this is Paul Semple. I'll move to close the hearing and move into deliberations. Okay. Eight, eight seconds. Okay, we need to vote on that. Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. Paul. Semple votes yes. Buck. Buck votes yes. Dave Thompson. Thompson says yes. And I vote yes. Okay, deliberations. Let's start with Paul. All right, this, uh, of course, presents uh, another new situation for an ADU, uh, which we haven't dealt with a lot of them, and uh, flips things a bit by the fact that the ADU is not really being built. Uh, it's being uh, a conversion of the existing property. Uh, the ordinance itself is sort of directed towards the concept that you're building the ADU. But um, as I look at the, the neighborhood, I see an awful lot of houses that are set back quite far on the lot. Um, if you look at the assessor's maps uh, for uh, Gladden Lane, Barcliff Avenue, and the corner of Barcliff and Old Harbor Road, you see a number of what I would call panhandle lots um, with houses to the rear, not unlike what we have uh, being proposed here, uh, although this would not be a panhandle lot as such. Um, and it seems to me that maintaining the cottage and the front 
with the perspective of the garage and building behind it, as we've seen it in the drawings, uh, continues to maintain a streetscape, which is um, pretty effective. So um, those are thoughts that have been going through my mind as I look at the question of whether this is an appropriate uh, proposal. The, uh, the new building meets all of our dimensional requirements in terms of density and, uh, and so forth and setbacks. I think with the uh, proposal for screening uh, between uh, 64 and 29, uh, we have some uh, effective ways of perhaps dealing with the issues. Um, the objections that are raised by 80 and 76 Barcliff, of course, come after the same thing was basically done uh, on that lot uh, several years ago. So um, overall, I think my incl inclination is to say that uh, this is a proposal which I could uh, approve as an ADU and uh, a special permit uh, for per for uh, building the additional house. Okay, uh, Buck, how do you feel? Well, I think the uh, applicants have presented an excellent case. The presentation was very detailed and uh, make a good argument for uh, us to consider. Um, unfortunately, uh, the the comments from the McDonald's and uh, the Waters and the Rutledges and the Limbacks is very uh, persuasive. And you can tell that they're all opposed to it, even though the wording is a little, uh, we'll say, uh, dancing around. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I, I'm kind of on the fence but I am uh, giving the neighbors, the abutters, um, maybe uh, a possibility that there could be a way to get back together with them and see what they can do to get this, uh, the back house moved uh, 20 feet um, and put the uh, SAS in the rear of the property. Okay, Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you, David. Um, it's a nice looking plan. I can't imagine moving the uh, house 15 feet towards the front. It's going to it's going to look really congested. Um, as of right now, it looks to me as if they've got close to uh, 100 feet between the house and the back line. Um, pushing it further front. It's going to be over 100 feet of of, uh, of green space in the back. If I did anything, if I said anything, if it was mine, I'd push it back further towards the back line and just heavily shrub it. Um, I'm inclined to vote in favor of, uh, of this plan. Thank you. Dennis. Yeah, I, I would concur with what Paul said. I, when we adopted the ADU, I don't think anybody expected that it was going to be this kind of a design for an ADU. But it is, um, you know, it's an antique garage, and, a, and I have to commend them in trying to save it. Um, I like the plan a lot, and if I were voting, I would certainly vote in favor of it. Megan? Mm, I will agree that I, with Buck on some level, that I think it's unfortunate. Um, that it dramatic. I, I think it does change the the people the the people's view in the back. But I, I think it's not um, it's not out of out of our regulations. I think that you know it fits. It's it's it was previously nonconforming, so you know it's it continues to be nonconforming. But I don't think that it, that it changes things. Um, and I like the plan, and I think they've done you know the best that they can with it. Bill, um, I would, you know, I'd agree that they they've come up with a 
with a plan probably that meets their needs uh, best. Um, I do think that there are some tweaks that could be done though with the location of the house that's proposed that could maybe meet, um, you know, meet the the regulations a little bit more closely, and and I think would come up with a better plan. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, I, I I think, and it's hard at this level, I think, but you know, it would be good to see exactly how much, you know, is being preserved. I think in a tight site like that, that the grading is going to significantly impact any vegetation that is on that site that remains other than in the very back. So that's just a fact. I, I do think that that's the case. So, you know, how much they're going to keep is, is marginal. And I think they're going to need to beef up some type of a landscape plan that, that will satisfy the neighbors. And I think everyone could then be happy. I think it is admirable that they're keeping that historic property in the front though, as best as possible. And hopefully it can remain a, you know, one bedroom unit. That's all I really can say about that. I would say, thanks. Hey, Vich. Um, yeah, well, I'm um, um, in alignment with m most of what Paul said, um, apparently all of what Paul said. I, um, I think that the neighbors, um, some, at least some of the neighbors presented a well, they well presented and, and argued um, um, concerns. Uh, I just don't come to the same conclusions that they do for the most part when I look at the situation. Um, I, I think that the, I, I think that by saving the old cottage and making that the ADU is maybe not what the uh, drafting of the AD bylaw anticipated, but that's a win-win for the town, honestly. Uh, it's, it, it's a minimal impact on, or minimizes the impact on the uh, streetscape. Uh, it saves the old house. You don't have to go through the, which would, I'm sure, please the historical commission, and it pleases, us, it pleases me, pleases us. Um, the, uh, I think it's a, a really good solution. With respect to tweaking the siting of the house, um, I just don't feel I I understand that there are concerns being expressed, but and and that this does require uh, because of the Dorkin case requires a special permit because of substantial chance. But I give a lot of weight when they meet the dimensional requirements of the bylaw with the new building, and so. They are doing that with respect to setback, with respect to lot coverage, it's everything else. So to me, I, I that um, sh shifts some of the balance of 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 the um, um, neighbors' objections. Really, I don't see it. I don't see what they're proposing, especially if they uh, do some of the planning that they propose to uh, help with the screening to the McDonald's house. I don't see that what they're proposing is substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. It meets the, the zoning requirements. The, the zoning would presume that the distance between this house and the McDonald's house, to the extent that they're, other than the extent that their building is non-conforming, the, the, at least what, what the applicants are doing in, in meeting this presumes that there's enough privacy, et cetera, left between the two houses. And they're doing the best that they can under those circumstances, and that's 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 the situation. I don't think that denying the ability or telling them they have to move the house is there's not enough to be gained there. I think that they can accomplish what they seek to accomplish with what they proposed. So, um, I certainly the ADU meets all the requirements criteria that that have been laid out for us. Um, they're not asking for substantial relief in any respect. Uh, from us. I know it's been characterized that way, but I don't see it that way at all. I think that any of the, any relief they're, they're seeking from us all falls within the kinds of things we normally see and we normally uh, find to be um, uh, okay with us. So I will, um, uh, and I don't think, I don't think when you start talking about moving the septic system and trying to re-engineer the septic system, I don't think it's, I don't think 
I want. I don't think I want to try to encourage that as well. I mean, the 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 ADU requirements are that they 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 feed the same septic system, and so if you move it to the back a lot, you, you're creating uh, problems that hopefully uh, are not that not going to be long lasting once the sewer goes down the street. So um, I'm being a little wordy, but I will support this enthusiastically. Okay, thanks. And from my standpoint, uh, I'm sorry that we don't have a landscape plan. Um, I think that would have helped us a lot. Uh, and we heard some specifics about what's going here and what's going there. But um, when I asked Caitlin about the height of these buildings, uh, that cured me of trying to encourage moving the new main house closer to the street. Because you have a situation where the old cottage, the historic one, is half the height of what the new one's going to be. So the further away, if you ask me, the better. Uh, is this substantially more detrimental to, uh, detrimental to the neighborhood? I don't see how we could justify saying that it is. It simply is not. It's a great improvement for the property. And as Dave Veach just pointed out, uh, getting an ADU uh, that works for, you know, an individual or a small family or something. It's great. It's great. So, uh, Paul, I, uh, uh, before we go on to uh, possibly voting, what do you think of conditions on this? And I bring it up because I would want one condition to be that there cannot be any water run to the second floor of that garage. You know, if it wants to be a studio, great. But I don't think I want to find out that there's a bathroom there or something like that. Um, they have to make the front one one bedroom, not two. So I don't think we need to condition that. Um, usual construction things, possibly. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Well, it, it, this is Paul Semple. I think we also should uh, add the conditioning with respect to the screening. Uh, the natural screening that would be uh, between the uh, this house and the uh, McDonald property, uh, 29 uh, Gladden. Um, and then I guess the question is, uh, uh, in terms of construction, what, uh, Jamie, do you know what the plan is in terms of when construction would take place? Uh, uh, they are targeting the fall right now, Paul, for the beginning of construction. Uh, this is a, it's a neighborhood that's actually pretty substantially uh, uh, year round, I guess. I mean, I'm, I don't think we're looking at uh, a lot of short term rentals and so forth in this area. Um, so I think that uh, probably uh, any construction vehicles and so forth can be contained on site so we can use our normal standard uh, conditions with respect to that. And uh, then the question of whether construction should be uh, uh, limited somewhat between June 30th and Labor Day is the other condition to consider. Dave Veach, how do you feel about conditioning? <clears throat> um, I'm, uh, uh, I'm in agreement with Paul. Um, I um, am not as concerned uh, as as the, you expressed about uh, water to the second floor of the garage. Um, I, I, you know, we see, it seems to me that we frequently see bonus rooms over garages and things, and, and we don't generally anticipate misuse of them or try to um, put up obstacles towards misuse of them. We know that sometimes these things may happen, but uh, I'm inclined to not um, seek to do that, um, but I, I can if 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 it pleases most of the members, I can go along with that as well. Yeah, the only thing about that, uh, Dave, is that most of the bonus rooms we approve over garages are part of the one structure, and here with this is a separate structure, and it's sort of throwing a bone to the neighbors who were concerned about something happening there down the line and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, uh, that's sort of like in the uh, good neighbor policy. That's really yeah. why I'm promoting I, that. I, maybe, sorry, sorry, Dave, just, but just what just popped in my mind, and that is true, 
we did ha encounter this with a garage back on Blackberry Lane there, and I don't yes. know what we yes. did. Did we do that said there? Yeah, I don't remember. Maybe Sarah remembers. Yeah, that, that was a situation where they had to uh, jackhammer up the floor. Oh, no, no, not that one. No, oh. I'm sorry. The, no, behind the, the Cape Cod 5 there. It was oh, oh, okay. Yeah. No, I was thinking about the one that uh, behind our back that ran the line. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. The Chairman, the, the water... Oh, yeah. sorry, Mr. Chairman, I was going to tell you that the water restriction is okay with the Campbells, is that's what the board... Uh, oh, good, okay. For. All right. Uh, how about the other members? Does any anybody have any specific concern about conditions? Yes, they're pro or con? Okay, uh, then. Thompson, I'd go along with what uh, Paul and Dave want. Okay, okay. Um so, uh, Paul, uh, why don't you make a motion, please? All right. Uh, this is Paul Semple. I'll move to approve the application uh, as uh, submitted with uh, the condition that um, any uh, construction activity and vehicles be contained on site, uh, that between June 30th and Labor Day, there'd be no exterior construction would be allowed, no work will be permitted on the weekends and construction activity would be between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. only. And then I would add the conditions that uh, the buffer uh, plantings, which have been offered by the applicant, would be installed uh, between the project and uh, the McDonald property at 29 Gladden. And I would add the uh, fact that uh, no uh, water uh, would run to the second floor of the garage building. Oh, okay. Dave Veach seconds. Okay. We will vote. Uh, Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. Paul. Sample votes yes. Buck. Buck votes yes. Dave Thompson. Dave Thompson votes yes. And I vote yes. That's a unanimous vote. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Norcross and Caitlin. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Let's go on, Sarah, to 21-018. Application number 21-018. Scott and Judith Stewart, care of William F. Riley Esquire, P.O. Box 707, Chatham, Mass. 02633. Owners of property located at 65 Squanto Drive, also shown on the Town of Chatham's Assessor's Map 10C, Block 18, Lot E16. The applicant seeks a dimensional variance under section 8D2C from the requirements of Appendix 2 to allow for the installation of an exterior mechanical system appliance generator 10 feet from the easterly abutter where a 15-foot setback is required. The lot is non-conforming in that it contains 15,557 square feet where 20,000 square feet is required in the R20 zoning district. A dimensional variance is required under Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, Section 10, and Section 8D2C of the Chatham Protective Bylaw. Okay, Mr. Riley, are you there? In fact, I am. You can well, see my smiling face. Can you do this in two minutes? Well, I can do part of it in two minutes. Go um, ahead. Anyway, so, all right, so uh, if you've been to the site, the, uh, uh, the uh, number one on the list is uh, the, the, the deck, uh, they want permission to widen it. Uh, they're sort of presumed on that because the deck's already there. Uh, and they also want to make the deck three feet longer. Uh, and, and that's already been done as well. So to the extent that's offensive to some, uh, we apologize. Uh, then they want to do a four and a half by four and a half uh, enclosed vestibule so they can go from the existing cellar into the cellar of the new section because there's is a foundation wall that prevents it. Uh, um, the, excuse me, Mr. Riley. We are on the variance for the generator right now. I haven't read the special permit yet. We're still Dave, on, can we control this for crying out loud? <laughs> we're still on 018. If you were listening to Sarah and I, you wouldn't have got confused. Well, I am confused, so I apologize. All right. Okay, so, all right, so the... the uh, once, once the, uh, when we first, before the board, uh, the generator was on the other side and was able to meet the setback. Um, once they started construction uh, and the contractor pointed out 
that the gas line uh, in the gas uh, came in on the east side of the house uh, and that the uh, electrical panel was also on the east side of the house and that if they uh, if they moved if they left the generator where it was it would cost them about twenty thousand uh, dollars and it would result in a, uh, a less efficiency uh, from the generator and so uh, it's a small ask. We think that's a we think that's a financial hardship. It's related to the the structure. The way the house is currently laid out. Uh, the uh, we believe that uh, you know that there's no uh, public detriment. Uh, the, the ask is small enough so that there's no uh, derogation of the purpose and intent of the bylaw. And uh, happily, uh, as opposed to the last meeting. Our neighbor to the east, the Gormans, uh, support the application regarding the generator. So uh, that would be our presentation on the on the generator. Very good. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak in favor of this? If so, please indicate on the screen so that Sarah can recognize you. I gotta get it. I gotta stop polishing the top of my head. I shine too much. <laughs> I see no one that wishes to speak in favor of this application. All right, I'll read the uh, correspondence. First of all, we have from the Conservation Commission here in town, Acting Conservation Agent Paul Whiteman writes on March 19th, the Conservation Commission has issued the permit for the project located at 65 Squanto Drive. All right. And then we have a note from Doug Gorman uh, this would be, um, hmm, I guess he's next door, huh? Cheryl and I have no issue with the location of the cement pad and the generator. We look forward to the Stewart family receiving all the permits necessary to complete what looks like a fine addition and renovation. Um, well, all right. So oh, is there anyone tell in the about, audience? Tell them about the air conditioner of getting friendly with the generator. <laughs> all right. The Gorman AC unit and the Stewart generator might become fast friends, but will probably operate on different schedules. Summer is coming, and I hope our AC gets a better workout than their generator. <laughs> that costs you an extra $10, your next fee. Okay. okay. <laughs> Any, anybody in the audience wish to speak against this or has a question? That's what I thought. Okay. Anybody there, Sarah? No one appears to want to speak. Okay, good. Does anybody on the board have any questions whatsoever? Just I have some questions, Dave. Go ahead. Uh, Dave Veach. Bill, um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a little curious here because I went out there and looked at it, and, and uh, it would seem to me, without getting my measuring tape out, that there would be a way or we ways to site this generator that would meet the 15 foot setback, not require a variance, and not be problematic. I mean, I know that generators have to be sited five feet away from a window, that much I know. And I can see that the electrical panel is on that side, the service on that side. There doesn't seem to be a gas line to the property at this point in time. There, they've got oil. Uh, uh, for the boiler, there's no gas meter anywhere, so they'll probably probably be putting a line in. Um, and so I would agree, it is better to have it on the side near the electric panel. And and but I don't know that they really did their due diligence in figuring out a location that would meet the uh, setback requirement. The well, the uh, it's my understanding that uh, you know the. The generator uh, operates more efficiently when it's a little further away from the from the building. I, I acknowledge that they could certainly turn it so the orientation uh, is north and south rather than east right. and west. Yeah. Uh, the uh, which would reduce to some degree uh, the request for the variance, but uh, the uh, I do, and I do believe uh, the there is an existing gas line to the house. I was there today while the gas line guys were working, and uh, I was watching the guy with his little beep 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 machine as he as he uh, followed the existing gas line into uh, where they were working. And uh, I think what had happened was 
uh, before they started working, they took the gas meter off the side of the house because the gas meter was laying on the ground when I got there today. See, so, I didn't see any of that the, the other day. So, okay. So, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, it's it's a it's a very minor ask, and uh, and the Gormans have no objection to it. And so, uh, okay. So, you know, right. you know, maybe they were poorly advised. I, I don't know. I'm just uh, we're a little stuck with what the contract is suggested. Okay, thanks. Does anyone else have a question? No, and I thought uh, I thought that this was the place to uh, put the generator as opposed to the other side. So, uh, and as Mr. Riley knows, I only vote nice. yes on one variance per year. <laughs> and this is it. All right. Let's uh, let's go into deliberations then, Paul. Uh, this is Paul Semple. I'll move to close the hearing can, and move into deliberations. Can the owner okay. speak for a moment? Uh, Judith, 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 Judith Stewart. Well, I can't figure out how to raise my hand. No, but Judith, this is Bill Riley. I I, I think we're in good shape. So okay. I, I just have more well, information. Can you, can you just tell me. Just tell me why. We'd like to state that the reason that the generator is in that position and not turn 90 degrees is because it doesn't meet code if we turn 90 degrees because the exhaust is too close to windows. It has to do with the current structure when the windows lie on the structure. So we had to move it at turn at 90 degrees. And also a dry, a dry well needs to be installed for the water runoff in that uh -huh. corner of the house. So they need to save room for the dry well as well. So there, and two generator companies came out and cited it. All right, all right. Thank you very much. I guess we're good to go, Dave. All right. All right, Paul. A motion to go into deliberations, please. Yeah, this is Paul Semple. I'll move to close the hearing and move into deliberations. Dave Veach seconds. Okay, we need to vote on that. Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. Paul. Sample votes yes. Buck. Buck votes yes. Dave Thompson and I vote yes. <laughs> okay. Deliberations. Uh, <laughs> what? Any thoughts? <laughs> I think everything they're asking for is pretty much already done. The uh, as as Attorney Riley mentioned, the Vestibule Foundation is done. The deck is. Lengthy. Well, we're not voting on that yet, Buck. We're not voting on that yet. This oh, is strictly the generator. Oh, I see. I was following Bill. I got. Confused. Well, don't don't <laughs> do that. Yeah, don't follow me, Buck. He'll lead you down the garden path to uh, God knows what. All right. Uh, so. Back to Buck, deliberations on the generator. I, the fact that the neighbors approves it and the neighbors uh, air conditioning condenser is right there, <laughs> I'm going to support it. All right. Dave Thompson. Thank you for calling on me. I'm most appreciative. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I'm in favor of this. It's logical. Dennis. Computer's gone here. Um, no, we can hear you. Here. We can hear you. Oh, you can. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, well, I'm not voting, so no one really cares. But I, I, <laughs> I don't have to vote against it, I guess. <laughs> Megan. <laughs> I would vote for it if I were voting. Bill. <laughs> I agree. I would vote for it as well. All right, Dave Veach. Well, I, I um, my questions were sufficiently answered. Uh, I find I can find that it meets uh, all the criteria, uh, and uh, can and will support it. Okay, uh, Paul. Uh, this is Paul Sample. I'm not going to discuss the criteria. <laughs> I will vote. Okay, and like I say, I don't usually vote for these, but. I don't see any reason why I can't on this case. So um, I don't know if we need to condition this at all, gang. So, Paul, a uh, motion, please. Yeah, this is Paul Semple. I'll move to grant the application as submitted. Dave Veach seconds. All right. Uh, time to vote. Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. Paul. Semple votes yes. Buck. Buck votes yes. Dave Thompson. Dave Thompson votes yes. 
And I vote yes. That's a unanimous decision, <laughs> Mr. Riley. Sarah, now maybe he'll allow you to read 21019. Application number 21-019, Scott and Judith Stewart, care of William F. Riley Esquire, P.O. Box 707, Shadow Mass, 02633. Owner of property located at 65 Squanto Drive, also shown in the town of Chatham's assessor's map 11M, block 6, lot P1. The applicant seeks to modify special permit number 19-094, granted on December 19, 2019, which allowed for the construction of additions and a front porch. The applicant now seeks to modify special permit number 19-094 to allow for the addition of a vestibule and extension of the approved deck. The existing dwelling and proposed additions will comply with all bulk and dimensional requirements of the bylaw. The approved building coverage is 2,176 square feet, 14.3%, and the proposed building coverage is 2,195 square feet, 14.4%, where 15% is the maximum allowed. The lot is non-conforming, and that it contains 15,557 square feet, where 20,000 square feet is required in the R20 zoning district. A special permit is required under Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 6 and 9, and Sections 5B and 8D2B of the Chatham Protected Bylaw. Mr. Riley. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, <clears throat> as I noted previously, uh, uh, the, the workmen got ahead of us and have already constructed the deck. Uh, which uh, I don't think represents a problem. The vestibule is, as a buck noted, the, the foundation, the footing is poured, uh, but none of these things have any effect on the neighborhood. And I can go through the criteria or I can simply say, none of the proposals uh, are substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing structure. That's fine, thank you very much. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to speak in favor of this modification? If so, please indicate on the screen so Sarah can recognize you. I see no one that wishes to speak in favor of this proposal. Okay, the correspondence on March 19th, Conservation Commission, Acting Conservation Agent Paul Whiteman writes, following a hearing, the Conservation Commission has issued the permit for the project located at 65 Squanto Drive. Then we have a note from Judith Giorgio, <clears throat> Town of Chatham, Board of Health. She writes on 4-6, I've reviewed the request of revisions. The additions, renovations as proposed will not increase the septic flow at the property, nor will it encroach on the existing septic system. Is there anybody in the audience who wishes to speak against this or has a specific question? If so, please indicate on the screen now so that Sarah can recognize you. <clears throat> I see no one that wishes to speak in opposition or has a specific question. Okay, then we'll have questions from the board. Uh, does any member of the board have a question? If so, please speak up. Hearing nobody, I will ask the general audience if there's anybody out there that wishes to speak against this or has a specific question. Uh, well, we already had that. Huh. All right, I'm just recycling back. So no questions. Paul, how about a motion? This is Paul Semple. I'll move to close the hearing and move into deliberations. Dave Veach seconds. Okay, we need to vote on that. Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. Paul. Semple votes yes. Buck. Upson votes yes. Dave Thompson. Thompson, yes. And I vote yes. Okay, deliberations. Let's start with Dennis. Um. Well, if I were voting, I would vote in favor of it. I'd like to know who the builder was, but I guess that's not important at this stage. Um, I think it meets all our standards, all our criteria. Megan. I would also vote for it, and I do not have any issue with it. All right, Bill. Uh, same. I would vote in favor of this as well. Dave Veach. Yeah, uh, this is certainly um, not, none of this is uh, substantially more detrimental than uh, what was previously proposed and, and approved. Paul? I agree with Dave Beach. Buck? I agree with Paul Semple. <laughs> Dave Thompson. 
Dave Thompson does um, agree with Buck. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, there's no sense about having conditions. Paul, how about a motion? This is Paul Semple. I'll move to grant the application as submitted. Dave Veach seconds. All right, we need to vote on that, Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. Paul? Yeah, we'll vote yes. Buck? Buck votes yes. Dave Thompson? Dave Thompson votes yes. And I vote yes. That is a unanimous decision. Thank you very much, Mr. Riley. Okay, let's go on to 21-020, Sarah. Application number 21-020, Robert Michael, LLC, care of William F. Riley, Esquire, P.O. Box 707, Chatham, Mass, 02633. Agreed vendee of property located at 1934 Main Street, also shown on the town of Chatham's assessor's map 7E, Block 3A, Lot S2. The applicant seeks to enlarge, extend, or change two non two conforming cottages on a non-conforming lot via the demolition of the existing cottages and the construction of two new dwellings. The proposed dwellings will comply with all bulk and dimensional requirements of the bylaw, <clears throat> but are considered a substantial alteration and under the second accept clause of section six of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, such substantial alteration requires the grant of a special permit. The existing building coverage is 766 square feet, 1.3%, and the proposed building coverage is 3,864 square feet, 6.7%, or 10% is the maximum allowed. The lot contains 57,137 square feet in the R20 zoning district. A special permit is required under Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 6, and Section 5B of the Chatham Protective Bylaw. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Yes. yes. The, uh, uh, so... I'm representing Robert Michael LLC. Uh, if you've been out to the property, uh, you know that there are two old shacks there that uh, uh, they would like to remove and construct two new homes with pools. Uh, these, you know, the buildings will be owned in condominium form of government. Yeah, that's that, I think that's the plan to leave up, Sarah. Uh, and the. Uh, uh, the property will be uh, connected to the town sewer. Uh, the applicant is proposing significant plantings <clears throat> along the eastern boundary, <clears throat> and uh, uh, all the all the uh, buildings and the pools meet all the required setbacks. Uh, Thad Eldridge, who is the the uh, surveyor engineer on the project, is available if you have any questions for him. Um, the, uh, I don't have an architect to tell you how great the design is. I'll just say they're traditional designs, uh, which, you know, fit, uh, in the neighborhood to the extent you can. I mean, the, the property to the West is an old cottage colony with, with, uh, small structures, the property to the East, uh, is an unusual property. And, but the area that's adjacent to uh, where the work is going to be done is, is primarily storage for boats and, and uh, uh, RVs and, and uh, you know, old cars, I guess. Uh, the, uh, but when you move outside of the immediate abutters, uh, I mean, across the street or on the other side of, of the, the property uh, to the east, you have uh, you know, the uh, Bailey's Path. And uh, so in, in, on the west side, particularly on the northwest side, on the other side of the uh, Cape Cod Rail Trail, again, you have, you know, more substantial single family residences, all of which are generally done in a traditional design. Uh, so uh, the applicant believes that, that uh, these designs uh, are, will fit in, uh, uh, you know, they, they're not proposing, you know, enormous structures that, you know, uh, when we go through the criteria, we point out that, uh, you know, uh, we're 2,000, over 2,000 square feet below the maximum building coverage. So I think, I think the uh, applicant 
has in mind uh, the neighborhood where they're where they're building the homes and, and has uh, designed uh, structures that uh, are going to fit in there. So uh, that'd be our presentation. I can run through the criteria. Yeah, quickly, if you will, please. I know it's after five o'clock. <laughs> oh, you know this. <laughs> I'm thirsty. Okay, yeah. adequacy, adequacy of the size of the site in terms of the size of the proposed use. Okay, so uh, we have 57,000 square feet exclusive of the panhandle, uh, more than twice the size uh, uh, of, a, of a lot in this zone, it's an R20 zone. And the proposed lot coverage is 2,000 square feet less than the maximum coverage. Uh, and we meet all the setbacks. Uh, so I, I think the size is adequate for the proposal. Compatibility of the size of the proposed structure with neighboring properties. Well, we, you know, we have this old uh, cottage colony on the west side uh, that is uh, are generally smaller uh, uh, buildings. Uh, uh, but you know, once, once you get outside of the immediate of butters, uh, the homes are, I think, very much in keeping with uh, the proposed size of, of these structures. Uh, you know, the extent of the proposed increase in non-conforming nature, uh, as uh, we know, in, under Bjorklin, even though we're meeting all the setbacks and dimensional requirements, uh, you know, because we have the non-conformity of, of two single-family homes on one lot. Uh, and we're intensifying that use. Uh, that's why we require a special permit. The uh, suitability of the site, uh, including but not limited to impact on neighboring properties or on the natural environment, including slopes, vegetation, wetlands, groundwater, water bodies, and stormwater runoff. Obviously, there are no wetlands nearby. Uh, there's obviously there's a grade change between uh, where the work is proposed to be done, the property. On the front and also uh, down to Route 28. As you look on the uh, the site plan, Sarah, can you go back to the site plan? That one. If you scroll up a little bit or scroll down, whatever, you can see that there are drainage structures located uh, along the eastern boundary, uh, and, and there's a trench drain, uh, all designed to uh, uh, to keep stormwater from entering onto Route 28. And they're going to be uh, sufficient grading and, and vegetation uh, to keep any uh, water from uh, going down onto the property in front. Uh, you know, the two other small houses that are there. Uh, there's been there's no evidence of uh, stormwater creating a problem there now, and our our construction is far enough away so that we're not going to change. Uh, the stormwater flow in that in that direction. So uh, basically, the the, uh, the land is level once you get back there. So we do believe that this site is suitable uh, for the proposed construction. The uh, impact of scale siting and mass on neighborhood visual character, including views, vistas, and streetscapes, uh, uh, because the, the buildings are set so far back, uh, I think it's unlikely that uh, the structure will be even visible uh, from uh, Main Street. Uh, there may be some visibility from the Cape Cod Rail Trail, uh, but again, they're very traditional designs, and I think that the uh, and they're set far enough back, both from the back lot line and from the street, so that uh, even if they were more massive, uh, rather than the rather modest size that they are, uh, they, they would not. Uh, constitute a problem. Uh, the to the extent they have an effect on the na neighborhood visual character, I think it's an improvement. And the uh, there's no views, vistas, or streetscapes that are affected. So I believe that uh, you know overall, uh, on question five, you could say that there's at least we believe there's no substantial, not substantially more detrimental than the existing structures. Compatibility of the proposed. Uh, with neighboring uses, you know, it's a residential neighborhood, and there are a lot of uh, residences there, and, and that's all. We're, that's all we're going to be doing. So we're compatible. Uh, sewage disposal is going to be by uh, town sewer, so I think that's uh, that's a good thing. The impact on traffic flow and safety. The uh, way the driveway uh, meets Route 28 is controlled by Mass uh, Department of Transportation. 
And so we, we believe that we're not going to have a negative impact on that. And then uh, noise and litter and adequacy utilities, uh, you know, they're just two single family homes. So we don't see a problem there. So we believe that uh, we meet the criteria and that the, the project is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing structures. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak in favor of this application? If so, please indicate now on the screen so that Sarah can recognize you. <clears throat> I see no one that wishes to speak in favor of this application. Okay, now I'll read the correspondence. On 4-8, Judith Giorgio, our health agent, writes, <clears throat> I've reviewed the plan to demo and rebuild the dwellings. The property is adjacent to the town sewer system. The proposal to build two dwellings with a total of seven bedrooms meets the requirements of the Board of Health and the sewer regulations. I have no concerns. And <clears throat> then we have a note from Michelle Clark, uh, town of Chatham employee. She writes, to date, the Historical Commission has not received an application for 1934 Main Street. Seeing that one of the cottages was built in 1900, the proposed demolition will require an application and approval by the Commission. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with regard yeah. to that. Yeah, go ahead. The, uh, they passed a rule, which I think is not particularly intelligent, that if you file an application uh, under one ownership, and then you transfer ownership, you have to start the application over again. <laughs> so uh, they should have an applic they should have something that says if you're an agreed vendee, you can you can apply and it works, but uh, maybe that'll be in the future. But that's why we haven't filed with them. Uh, we, and the, the another thing is we don't really know if it was built in 1900 or not. What happens is the uh, assessor's office, if they don't have a date, they just they just give it 1900 as a default date. So, uh, okay. All right. Well, that takes care of the correspondence. Is there anyone out there that would like to speak either against this application or has a specific question? If so, please indicate on the screen so that Sarah can recognize you. <clears throat> we do have someone that would like to speak, Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, uh, Richard, would you please uh, tell us your name? Sure, uh, Richard Rimza. I live in Bailey's Path on Nine on Kate's Way. Okay, uh, the floor is yours. Go ahead. <clears throat> uh, we've done the best we can, including sending you a fax. I don't know if you got it in time. Whereas we objected to the the. Uh, um, building of those uh, tearing down a property building because we didn't have any information have no knowledge we went on the website we tried to get things uh you know as per the instructions from the letters and we uh, i failed miserably okay so i'm objecting i'm objecting until i find out what we got here my first question is the the i, I understand there's a cottage or a two piece of property up there they're going to be torn down and there's two new uh, homes uh, proposed and apparently with swimming pools, or whatever. That's the first I heard of it in that kind of detail. Who, what is the road access to those homes? Is it from Route 28? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. The, the property okay. is a, a panhandle lot uh, and the panhandle itself is 30 feet wide. And the uh, access at the street is controlled by the Mass Department of Transportation, and we can only construct uh, the access in accordance with their standards. Okay. I, I heard somebody else speaking. So there was a, an article in the paper about Eastwood Turn and some, some things over to Bailey's, from Bailey's Path. And my concern when we saw that was the access was coming through Bailey's Path to those two, to to, the, to those two new houses, are you you're saying that they're, they're not related at all? No, the the um, what Eastwood turned over to the town was an easement, uh, so that members of the public 
and go through Bailey's path to get to the bike trail. It was part of the, it was a requirement of the approval of the subdivision. Uh, and it just had uh, kind of slipped uh, and nobody had noticed it wasn't done when they brought it to Eastwood's attention. Uh, I drafted the easement and we recorded it. Okay, so that was my concern. The access to those two houses was putting the two together. Say, are they talking about coming through Bailey's path of which I am, you know, I'm, I'm right there on on Kate's way and I'm right by the tennis courts. And I'd say, oh, is that why, is that why I got the uh, abutters to notice? But the answer is, you've answered my question. We're gonna build two nice dwellings. It's coming from 28. It's got nothing to do with access through Bailey's path and it's got nothing to do with the article in the paper. And is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I don't have any. Oh, oh yeah, so no, no objection. Okay, uh, is there anyone else, Sarah, that you see out there that wishes to speak against us or has a specific question? Oh, uh, one question while I still have you. Oh, I lost you. I, I think we took care of your question, sir. No, I have one more. Can I access those plans? Are those plans available? If I went down to the town hall, can I see those plans? Uh, no, but they'll send them to you by email. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right, back to my original question. Is there anyone else out there? <laughs> Not that I see at this time. Okay, very good. Then we'll have questions from the board. Let's start with Megan. I have no questions at this time. Bill. Yeah, I have a question. Do you have the easement in place for access for that property in the front of you, along 28? I mean, for the... I mean, it says on the plan that there, yeah. yeah. yeah it's been created. It, it had not been recorded yet because we don't own the property. Okay, so he agrees with that. He's okay with all that. Well, the guy, uh, the owner of the, of the little house closest to the access is actually the owner of the back piece also. Oh, okay, well, that makes it easy. Okay, well, I didn't know. Okay, all right. Um, I don't think I have any other questions, Dave. Thank you. Okay, Dave Leach. Uh, I have no questions, Dave. Paul. Yeah, this is Paul Semple. Uh, Bill, what's the history on the uh, the cottages in the back there? They've been there a long time, Paul. I, I, honestly, you know, I moved to town in 1973, and. Uh, I think this lot has been for sale since then. <laughs> have have the uh, have the cottages been <laughs> occupied at all? Um, I, I'm not a, well. At some point, the answer is yes. Uh, when they were last occupied, uh, I, I really couldn't tell you. I do know that uh, there are there are kitchens and uh, toilet facilities in each building. Uh, I mean, it didn't look as if they'd been occupied for quite a long time. Well, I, I think that's accurate. At least not by humans, right? Well, uh, <laughs> well no, wait a minute. Well, maybe well, maybe Jimmy, had... remember Jimmy, the guy who lived in the woods? He might have spent some time in there. Yeah, there's probably people in them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Now let's get back on track here. Bill, let me just ask you... Uh, for some legal advice here, I'm I'm curious as to whether the use has been discontinued for a period of two years, no, such it's... that such that you're not in a position to put two houses on it. Well, the uh, the question of abandonment is one that's uh, determined by uh, uh, you know the chief zoning officer, the building commissioner. Uh, we've reviewed it with him, and he has not raised an objection in that regard. He did want to know about uh, whether there were uh, kitchens uh, and toilet facilities in each building. In general, uh, when you have a structure uh, that's uh, dedicated to a purpose, uh, in this case as a residence, um, the fact that you're not actually, you don't actually live in it uh, doesn't constitute abandonment. 
So that, that's well, sort I'm of not, the general rule. I'm not, I'm not so much looking at abandonment as discontinuation. Well, I know, but that under our bylaw and under the Zoning Enabling Act, uh, the question is uh, abandonment is the issue. In other words, you don't lose it right. You don't. You specifically don't lose rights to a nonconformity unless there's been an abandonment. Well, that, uh, that's under the that, bylaw. That's not what that's not what the ordinance says. I mean, the ordinance under five A says that the nonconforming use, which has been abandoned or discontinued for a period oh. of two years, shall not be reestablished. And any future use shall conform with the bylaw. Well, I which think would, that oh, which would mean presumably that you would put one house, not two houses there, unless you subdivide the lot in some way. I, I think substrate that music was playing on their end. All right, so somebody else is on the line here. Anyway, so I think the uh, you know where it says abandoned or discontinued, I think I think that has to do with. Uh, it kind of an active use. I can tell you that in general, uh, uh, where you have a, a, a residential structure, as long as the residential structure stands and has the components uh, that are capable of being used, it's not continued to consider abandoned or discontinued. I mean, under the, under the case law, it's all about abandonment. So, okay. I think I think if they I think if you're talking discontinuance, uh, you're talking about uh, you have a a building that's uh, uh, as a retail store in a, in a residential zone, and uh, you know, and then so you uh, convert it to a residence or to some uh, you know permitted use, and then you want to go back to retail. And they say, "I'm sorry, it's been discontinued." I think it, rather than uh, taking a single-family residence like this. Okay, thank you, Buck. Re, uh, Mr. Chair, what part of the uh, hearing are we still on? <laughs> We're asking questions of Mr. Riley about these two uh, cottages. Thank you. I have no questions. Okay. Dave Thompson. Uh, Dave Thompson has no questions of Mr. Riley. Dennis. Um, Dennis Sullivan, I have no questions, and I do agree with Bill's interpretation, the distinction between uh, abandonment and discontinuance. Thank you, Dennis. All right. Okay, uh, Paul, a motion, please. This is Paul Semple. I'll move to close the hearing and move into deliberations. Dave Veach seconds. Okay, need to vote on that. Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. Paul. Semple votes yes. Buck. Upson votes yes. Dave Thompson. Thompson, yes. And I vote yes. Okay, uh, deliberations. Uh, Bill. Um, I don't think I have any other comments. Okay. On that. Thanks. Dave Veach. Um, well, I, gee, I, I, I'm kind of sorry to see the old cottages go, but, uh, <laughs> the, um, piece of old Cape Cod, but that's up to the historical commission, I guess. So, um, as far as our, as we're concerned, um, this proposal uh, meets all of our criteria. It's certainly not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. And so uh, I will uh, vote in favor. Paul. Uh, this is Paul Semple. I, I will defer to the uh, opinions of uh, Dennis Sullivan and Bill Riley, I guess. Uh, and uh, if that's the case, then it, clearly it's not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. So uh, I would vote to approve. Buck. Clearly uh, not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood, so I will support. Dave Thompson. Um, I will definitely support what a difference it's going to make in that neighborhood. Right. Dennis. Yeah, Dennis Sullivan. Yeah, certainly not more detrimental to the neighborhood, and it's good for the town. I noticed that this, this property is assessed at $200,000. I assume, Bill, that the assessment's going to go up substantially. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you're probably right, Dennis. <laughs> yeah. Megan. I'll miss the cottages, but yeah, I'd vote for it. <laughs> All right. So, so, hey, Megan, did you have a party there when you were in high school? I'm going to leave that one for... <laughs> <laughs> 
man. What a place to have it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Paul, a motion, please. This is Paul Semple. I'll move to close the hearing and move into deliberations. Dave, eight seconds. Okay. We got, uh, let's see, do we? Um, I believe we just did deliberations. Oh, <laughs> I think we need a motion, Paul, on the special permit. Okay. This would be, this is Paul Semple. I'll move to approve the application as submitted. I guess the question is any conditions that we may need on it, but it looks to me as if the property is going to be accessible with everything off site. So uh, off the roads, clearly off 28. So uh, we should be all set. I guess the question is, does this impact any neighboring properties such that we need to be concerned about summer act hours and so forth. Uh, Dave Veach, how do you feel about that? Um, well, you know, I'm just, in, in terms of what I saw out there and, and the size of the lot and everything, I, I, I don't think this is one where we should be imposing uh, the no summer work uh, conditions. I don't think that would be necessary. Okay. Does anyone disagree with that? No, uh, Dave, Nick, and Bill Riley, uh, we're happy to have uh, no work on weekends and uh, eight to five during the summer months. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So, Paul, um, if you uh, would make a motion again. I'll yep. move to approve the application as submitted with the conditions just suggested by Mr. Riley. Okay. Dave Veach seconds. All right. Voting. Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. Paul. Apple votes yes. Buck. Thompson votes yes. Dave Thompson. Thompson, yes. And I vote yes. Okay, that's a unanimous vote. Thank you very much, Mr. Riley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, application 21-021. Application number 21-021. Douglas and Martha Coy, care of Chris Cannon, P.O. Box 201, Chatham, Mass. 02633. Owners of property located at 40 Oyster Bluff. Also shown in the Town of Chatham's Assessor's Map 12E, Block 28, Lot H7. The applicant seeks to enlarge, extend, or change a non-conforming dwelling on a non-conforming lot via the construction of an addition. The proposed second floor addition will comply with all bulk and dimensional requirements of the bylaw, but is considered a substantial alteration and under the second accept clause of Section 6 of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, such substantial alteration requires the grant of a special permit. The building coverage will remain 3,188 square feet, 9.9%, where 10% is the maximum allowed. The lot is non-conforming and that it contains 32,022 square feet, where 40,000 square feet is required in the R40 zoning district. A special permit is required under Mass General Law Chapter 40A, Section 6, and Section 5B of the Chatham Protective Bylaw. Good Mr. Cannon. How are you? It's Chris Cannon uh, representing uh, Doug and Martha Coy. Uh, before I go on, I got to absolutely give a shout out to Dallas. He's doing a wonderful job. Good. He, the, all those guys do. Yeah, well, Dallas in particular, he spent half his life at my, my house when he was a kid. So. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, so this is a fairly simple one. We uh, we're not adding any coverage. This is a uh, it's a 32,000 uh, square foot uh, lot. Um, absolutely, uh, sort of in the average of lots in in their neighborhood in Absagami and Oyster Bluff. Uh, there are a few lots bigger, a few lots smaller. Same with the houses. There's some that are bigger and some that are smaller. So it's uh, absolutely uh, you know sort of the average of the the lot. This is a one story house with two bedrooms and an outbuilding which is a garage with uh, two bedrooms which is a guest cottage uh, and uh, our proposal is to add a second floor move one of the bedrooms upstairs and add a second uh, bedroom to the upstairs so the house would become a three bedroom house and uh, the septic currently is a six bedroom septic though we appear to only be using four of the bedrooms uh, if we are required at the point when we hook up to septic, which has been brought or sewer, which has been brought down the street uh, by the association, um, if we are required to petition for an added bedroom, we will, though, uh, as I said, we have a six bedroom septic, so I don't think that's going to end up being necessary, um, regardless of its uh, the size of the lot. Um, we'll do so. And uh, 
essentially we're just uh, pushing some things around and adding uh, the, the 655 square feet on the second floor, no added coverage. Um, so that's about all we're looking to do. Um, I'm happy to speak to the criteria if you'd like me to do so. Yeah, only the ones that uh, are a little uh, different than the, what you already covered, you know, like views and that kind of stuff. Yeah, so there there are uh, no views impacted here. This is sort of a little bit of an island. Um, it's well planted around the exterior, the perimeter of the property. Uh, we have no intention, as I know that uh, one uh, person has, has uh, you know, stressed uh, an interest in, that we do not uh, prune or, or touch any of the plantings along the, the perimeter. We have no intention of doing so. Um, and uh, it simply is that we are adding a second floor. It's 100% uh, conforming with the setbacks, uh, though the house does, uh, portions of the house do uh, sit within the setbacks and saw a special permit back in 2005 or six, I believe, to, to gain that, uh, uh, those, uh, Encroachments, uh, but this is uh, conforming, and uh, we did that intentionally. We we don't want to cause any waves in the neighborhood, and, and uh, so uh, it, as I said, it's comparable in size. Uh, uh, let's see, what else do we have here on the list? Uh, the site is absolutely suitable. No no groundwater issues. We're not creating any water uh, runoff where it doesn't already exist. Um, I don't believe there's any impact to the uh, neighborhood uh, character. Uh, it's absolutely uh, quite similar to what's already there. Uh, traffic flow, this is a uh, cul-de-sac, uh, so absolutely no changes to that. Look, noise and litter will be the typical that you'll find in a construction project. And utilities uh, really don't change at all. As I said, they have brought uh, sewer down. I don't know that they've been ordered to uh, to hook up yet, but uh, that will be coming in the next year or so. Um, and uh, design has been done by uh, Clark uh, for that. Uh, as for the impact, uh, the, the neighborhood, I just, uh, I don't imagine it's it's uh, any problem. It doesn't affect anybody's views. All right. Very good. Uh, Dave, Dave uh, Stennis, I'm recruiting myself a little butter. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Dennis. Okay, uh, thank you, Chris. I'll ask, the, is there anybody in the audience that wishes to speak in favor of this application? If so, please indicate on the screen now so that Sarah can recognize you. There does not appear to be anyone who wishes to speak in favor. Okay, I'll read the correspondence. The first is from Judith Giorgio, our health agent. She writes on 4-6, I have reviewed the plan to renovate. The proposed plan does not increase the septic flow. The house has an existing three-bedroom dwelling. I have no concerns. Then we have a uh, email. This is from Thomas Anaschuk. Anaschuk? Chick, maybe? Anaschuk. He writes on April 5th. As a property owner across from 40 Oyster Bluff, I fully support their application for a special permit for the second floor addition. That's Catherine and Thomas, and their address is 23. <clears throat> then we have a note from Gerd and Norma Wagner. They're at 118 Absagami Run. They, let's see, this was received on April 5th. They write, as neighbors, we would like to state our support for the Coy's intention to construct of their existing dwelling, in addition as designed by Chris Cannon, <clears throat> one of the best architects in town. This gentleman must have spent some time at your house also, Mr. Cannon. <laughs> we trust that uh, the zoning board will recognize the architectural value of the undertaking and issue the required special permit. Then we have a note. This is from Evan Met Metropolis. And Evans at 55 Oyster Bluff on April 5th. He writes, I'm writing to you to express my full support. They are wonderful neighbors and have become good friends over the last 30 years. They are always very considerate and respectful to all the neighbors and always willing to help anyone. They also maintain their property extremely well. 
As the family has grown, three beautiful daughters, they require more living space to be comfortable in their home. Frankly, I'm surprised that they didn't do this renovation years ago. Their design seems to fit well with our neighborhood and will not disturb anyone or anything. Our family has been in Chatham since 1986. These are the type of people I feel we want living in our great town. And then we have a note from uh, Gail and David Oppenheim, trustees of 87 Absagani Rum Nominee Trust. They write on April 5th, we're the owners of 87, which directly abuts the Coy residence to the west. We have reviewed the plans of the addition slash renovation proposed for their home and find it <clears throat> attractive and in keeping with the neighborhood. Our only concern is regarding the mature plantings along our shared boundary, which have been there for years. There's a large cedar on the Coy lot and a grouping of 20 to 25 foot tall abravite on our lot line, straddling perhaps. These plantings have been a buffer between our two homes for over 25 years. We do support the COI's application with a condition that these plantings, especially the Abravite, be preserved at their present height in order to maintain our mutual privacy. Thank you for your consideration in this matter. <clears throat> and then we have a note from uh, Nason and Susan Kahn. There are 59 Absagani Road. They write on April 5th, our property 59 is located at the corner of Oyster Bluff and Absagani Run. We are abutting neighbors of the property owned by Douglas and Martha Coy at 40. We're in full support of the Coy's proposed addition to their existing home. We have viewed the drawing of the proposed renovation and find it to be most tasteful and fitting in style to the existing homes in the surrounding area. Then we have a note from Rich Jenkins. He's at 18 Oyster Bluff. He writes on April 4th. I own the adjacent property to the north of the Coys. My family and I have enjoyed them as neighbors for 20 years. We've reviewed application 20-021 carefully and have no objections to it. In fact, we're in favor of it, as it appears to be an unobtrusive addition that blends in well with the existing structure and neighborhood. The Coys have been a great part of our 20-home neighborhood, and we support their efforts to upgrade their existing home to match their needs. <clears throat> Therefore, we support granting their special permit request. And then we have a note from Michael Brown and Lisa Holt at 83 Absagani Run. They uh, write on March 29th as a budding neighbors, we'd like to voice, uh, voice our support. Uh, their property is located two houses away from ours. Doug and Martha have been longtime residents of a close knit neighborhood of 20 homes and are extremely well liked. Their yard is nice and landscaped and has always been well maintained. They have a lovely family and have spoken of their desire to retire to Chatham at some point. We hope this addition will allow them the comfort they would come to expect when they become full-time residents of Chatham. Finally, Doug and Martha provided us for the drawing of the front, that is the east view, and the rear, the west, the rear west view of their home as it would look after the renovation. It is tasteful and would fit in well with the traditional nature of the surrounding homes. And that's the extent of the correspondence. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak either against this application or has a specific question? I see no one that wishes to speak in opposition or has a specific question. Okay, then we'll have questions from the board. Uh, Dave Beach. Uh, Dave Beach has no questions. Paul? Paul Sample has no questions. Buck? Buck has no questions. Dave Thompson? Dave Thompson, uh, no questions, sir. Uh, Dennis has recused himself. Megan? Megan's story has no questions. Bill? No questions for me either, Dave. Okay, and... Uh, the only question I have is, uh, Chris, you said that uh, there was be no um, chopping of trees, et cetera, et cetera, and all that. Do you have an objection to the um, request that the Oppenheims had, which is our only concern regarding the uh, mature plantings along our boundary? Uh, it's a large cedar and a grouping of adbravite on our lot uh, on our lot line. These plants have been a buffer between our homes for over 25 years. Uh, we request that a condition that these plantings, especially the Abravita, 
be preserved at their present height. Is that a problem that you have at all, Chris? No, no objections to that. So we can include that in there, okay. Uh, we'll do. All right, so um, I think, Paul, we need a motion to go into deliberations. This is Paul Semple. I'll move to close the hearing and move into deliberations. Dave Veach seconds. Okay, we got a vote on that, Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. Paul? Campbell votes yes. Buck? Thompson votes yes. Dave Thompson? Dave Thompson, yes. Okay, and I vote yes. Okay, deliberations. Let's start with uh, Megan. Let's start with Megan. <laughs> I knew it was coming my way. Um, right. I see no opposition to this. I think it's only beneficial to the neighborhood, and I would certainly support it. Okay, Bill. I would also I would also support it. I think it's a, a nice plan and uh, certainly beneficial to the neighborhood as well. Dave Beach. Uh, I, I would agree. It's a, it's a nice looking design and uh, certainly not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. It's, just, it's an improvement. Yes, I agree with Dave Beach. But. Yep, it uh, certainly uh, meets all of our criteria and is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. All right, Dave Thompson. Meets the criteria, and it's a, it's a very nice addition. Um, I definitely will vote yes. Okay, and I agree with all of the above. So, Paul, um, do you think we need any conditions in, regarding construction, or is this so far out of the way it doesn't make any difference? I don't think we need any conditions other than the uh, condition concerning the uh, plantings uh, okay. in the quarter um, uh, that you've read from uh, uh, David uh, Oppenheim. Okay. So would you make a motion, please? Yes. Move to, uh, Paul Stemple, I'll move to approve the application as submitted with the condition that the plantings uh, remain undisturbed on the property. Okay. All right. So, um, and to read that again, Sarah, do you have that? Um, yeah, I, I do. I just had one question because if if I write the condition that they shall be preserved at the present height, mm -hmm. that would mean they would need to continue to trim them every year to keep them at the height they're at currently. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So, just to clarify, so they no? shall not be cut lower than the present height? Yeah, I think that's better. Yes. Okay. I, I'm, I'm just confirming that. So it will read uh, the mature trees along the common property line with 87 Absigami run shall be preserved at a height no lower than currently exists. Okay. And um, I would specifically refer to the cedar uh, and arborvitae, you know, okay. as opposed to the gen generic tree. Okay. All right. So that's good. So it is. Uh, Time to vote. Dave Veach. I don't know if I second it. I second the motion. Okay. Now it's time to vote. <laughs> Dave Veach. Veach. Yes. Paul. Uh, just to clarify for me again, Sarah, how would that condition read? Okay. So with Dave's suggestion, um, the mature trees comma, cedar and arborvitae along the common property line with 87 Absigami run shall be preserved at a height no less than that which currently exists. Uh, the only, the only, which I'm not sure how we can enforce, but. <laughs> yeah, well, the only, the only question I have about that is that if, if for some reason one of those trees, not as a result of this construction, uh, dies, does this does that condition then obligate this property? To, they would need to replant it. Yeah, which I don't think is what we intend. Uh, it seems to me that if what we intend is that if this construction should affect any of those uh, plantings, uh, or what we're saying is that this construction shall not affect any of those plantings. Here well, I don't think that's what Mr. and Mrs. Oppenheim said in their letter. Do you think that they expect that uh, if if one of those trees should die, not related to this con this this construction, that this property would be obligated to repla replace no, it? No, I don't. I think what they are expecting is that uh, they not be cut, uh, they not be cut because of this construction or after the construction. Right, 
and I think that's what we should say in our condition as opposed okay. to the way we had it. Okay. So how, uh, how would you like the condition written, Paul? Uh, that the, uh, the, the, the there, there will be no uh, cutting or pruning of any of the uh, arborvitae or other plantings between this property and uh, 87 uh, Absagami run. Period. Period. Perfect. Yeah, okay, good. Because that's that takes care of everything. I think all right. So so I move approval based on that condition. Okay. Second. Dave Veach seconds. Okay. So we got a vote on that, Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. Paul. Apple votes yes. Buck. Upson votes yes. Dave Thompson. Thompson, yes. And I vote yes. That's a unanimous vote. Thank you very much, Mr. Cannon. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, Sarah, let's go on to 21-025. Okay, 21-025, Town of Chatham, care of Weston and Sampson Engineers, 7 Perimeter Road, Manchester, New Hampshire, 03103. Owners of property located at 221 Kroll Road, also shown on the Town of Chatham's assessor's map, 13G, Block 0, Lot 13. The applicant seeks a dimensional variance under Section 8D2C from the requirements of Appendix 2, which allow for the demolition of the existing salt shed and construction of a new shed, salt shed, which exceeds the allowable, bu allowable building height. The existing shed is 30.4 feet and the proposed shed is 40.1 feet, where 30 feet is the maximum allowed. The lot contains 249,000 square feet in a municipal zoning district. A dimensional variance is required under Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, Section 10, and Section 8D2C of the Chatham Protective Bylaw. Okay, and who do we have to present this to us? Hello, uh, my name is Tyler Cofalici. I'm representing the town of Chatham DPW, or Department of Public Works. Okay, welcome, Tyler. Thank you. Um, I uh, put together a quick presentation just to help visualize what we're going to be talking about. Uh, Sarah, do you mind if I share my screen? Go right ahead, Tyler. Okay. All right. So um, I'll I'll go through this briefly, and uh, we can have questions um, afterwards. So this is uh, a photo of the existing salt shed. The existing salt shed is located um, in the town of Chatham, as shown in this red circle. We uh, zoom into the property. We got the existing salt shed located next to the existing DPW's uh, storage garage. On the property is also the town's fueling system that provides fuel to the town's uh, vehicles. Um, flanking the existing salt shed are uh, bulk storage material bins and also on the site beneath the pavement is an old landfill that has been uh, closed during the construction of the vehicle storage garage. And to the south of the site is um, a public bike path. So this property is associated with um, the municipal district, which is associated with a 25 foot road buffer, 15 foot of butter buffer and the 30 foot building height. Um, so if we plot those on the plan, you'll see that the existing conditions meet, the existing salt shed meet the setback requirements and also uh, falls outside of uh, the 100 foot uh, wetland buffer from uh, the bogs adjacent to the property. Um, the proposed salt shed's going right on top of the old one. Um, it's gonna be a high arch gambrel. This is a, an example photo of the high arch gambrel salt shed. It's a structure specifically designed for use at, for salt operations. Um, two main features I'll point out uh, are the 12 foot tall push walls and uh, the 30 foot tall entrance way. And um, I'll get into both of those features why they're important shortly. Um, also being proposed is a rear lean-to canopy off the back. It's an example photo showing um, very similar what is being proposed to uh, store either vehicles or equipment that the DPW is currently being stored outside. So it provides some cover for them. Um, so the reason we're here is because of the proposed salt shed is uh, to be 40 foot, about 40 feet tall, where the maximum is 30 feet for this 
for this site. Um, and we believe that the enforcement of the maximum building height for Chatham would entail substantial hardship for not only the DPW operations, but also taxpayers and the environment. And um, I'll just quickly go through some of these reasons. So the existing salt shed stores about 1,200 tons, and it's an insufficient amount to uh, supply the city for the entire year. Um, and speaking with the DPW director, he has to order anywhere between five to six shipments a year just to maintain enough supply for the snow fighting season. Um, the proposed salt shed uh, would store about 2,000 tons, which is a 60% increase, which would help reduce some of that you know, stress in maintaining a appropriate supply for uh, snow fighting. Um, and if we were forced to go to a shorter shed to meet this added capacity, we wouldn't be able to go any wider due to the north of the close proximity of the vehicle storage garage and to the south is uh, the bike path and um, the grade also goes up in this area. So there's no room to go up and down. If we look to the west, we have the limits of the salt shed and existing catch basins that prohibit us from going in this direction, which leaves us um, the only direction would be to expand out to the right here. Um, so this limit in red is shown what the the length of the salt shed would be in order to hold 2,000 tons. And if with this arrangement, there would not be enough space for the DPW, DPW to perform their operations um, between the existing material storage bins and the proposed shed. So uh, another point is that a, a shorter, longer building would also increase construction costs due to more foundations, more surplus soil, more roof square footage, et cetera. Um, uh, also having a shorter salt shed requires uh, salt deliveries to be dumped outside, which requires DPW um, employees to, and a loader to take the salt shed, move it in. Um, with a the new proposed high arch gambrel, it's actually designed to have the salt deliveries dumped directly in the shed. Um, once it's in there, you don't need to touch it. And this is just an example showing a salt delivery in a high arch gambrel. Um, and the truss and entrance height are designed such that if the driver forgets to lower his bucket and he drives out, um, it would be clear and would not damage the structure. Um, some other notes for dumping outside is that uh, dumping outside can lead to about 5 to 10% roughly of the annual salt budget. So that's salt that's left on the ground after being moved in that um, would then lead to more salt going into the stormwater, which eventually leads to discharging into the environment. So both negatives for the lower structure. Um, lastly, the, low, the lower structure would significantly increase uh, maintenance costs due to damage that you can see in the existing structure. So this is damage to the trusses from the loader, um, you know, through the years, these get nicked. And if you go and look at the salt shed, there's evidence of damage, um, you know, pretty frequently. So, you know, relief from this 30 foot maximum building height, we believe would not be a detriment to the public, but instead it'd be, a, um, a, you know, a great, a good to the, to the public. Um, and before I open it up to questions, I just wanted to present a couple um, photo renderings of what the proposed salt shed would look like. So this is looking north from the bike path at the existing salt shed. Um, just real quickly, this is a rendering of what a new one would look like. And again, from Chatham from the street. So again, um, an example of what the new one would look like. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Are there any questions? Oh, well, there's always questions. Thank you very much, Tyler. Uh, so I'll uh, first uh, open this up to the public. Uh, and uh, is there anyone out there that would like to speak in favor of this proposal? If so, please indicate on the screen now so that Sarah can pick it up that you would like to speak. I only see one member of the public and he's not raising his hand. Okay, well then I'll read the correspondence. First of all, we have a note from Judith Giorgio, a health agent. I've reviewed the plan to demo and rebuild the salt shed. I have no concerns. 
<clears throat> and then we have a note from Catherine Halpern. She's the planning board chair. She writes on the 29th of March. Planning board at their March 22nd meeting reviewed the ZBA's request for comment on the above reference application to replace an existing salt shed with a new high arch Gambrel salt shed with a rear facing lean to canopy for equipment storage. After review of this request, the board voted unanimously to send a positive recommendation of the ZBA and tells us who voted. If you have any questions, we don't. So uh, <clears throat> that's the extent of the correspondence. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak either against this or has a specific question if so, please indicate so that Sarah can recognize you. No, no. Again, I see no one uh, that wishes to speak in opposition or has a specific question. Okay, so we'll have questions from the board. Let's start with Dave Veach. Uh, Dave Veach has no questions. Paul. Uh, I can't resist asking if you have considered a salt shaker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Move along. I have no other questions. Buck. I have no questions. Dave Thompson. <clears throat> um, Dave Thompson doesn't have any questions. Um, I'm going to, uh, well, I have questions, but I'm not, I'm going to pass. All right. Dennis. Um, I just have one question. Um, regarding this lot, you mentioned that there were catch basins that would interfere with the elongation of the building. Um, and I was wondering, is there anything else peculiar about this lot that would that would impact the, um, would be detrimental to, to an elongation of the building? Yes, um, uh, the landfill that's capped below the pavement, if, um, you know, if we extend the footprint of the salt shed into there, there would be, you know, an increased cost for disposal of that soil and along with other uh, DEP related permitting requirements. So we're, okay. yeah. So it's a pretty unique lot then. Yeah. Okay, that's all I have, thank you. Megan. I have no questions. Bill. Nope, my question was just answered about the landfill, thanks. Okay, well, I have a question um, of Tyler. Uh, Tyler, why, are we as a community still throwing salt on our highways? We're spending, maybe you don't know, but we're spending uh, roughly 500 million bucks to sewer the entire town, to clean up the estuaries, the bays, and you know, folks' yards and everything else. And, and I find it hard to believe that it's a great idea to spend a million bucks to increase the ease of using salt on our highway so it can run into our lawns and everything else. And so tell me why why I should think that's a great idea. Um, the snow fighting operation that the, you know, the DPW provides is uh, a safety for the drivers on the road during snowstorms. Um, the pretreatment with salt helps prevent ice buildup and reduces dangerous situations on the roads of Chatham. Do you have any idea what the uh, average snowfall in the town of Chatham is? I do not know. Yeah, well, it's uh, Buck. You might know the answer to that question. What's the average snowfall here? Is that even? Is that even ten? Are you asking me? Yeah. I, actually, Dave, um, I think it it's not really uh, a ten foot snow or a ten inch snow is not half as dangerous as uh, a quarter inch of ice, so black ice. Um, I, I, we have we had seven or eight snows this winter, none of them over an inch or two. And there were many times I thought uh, walking on Stage Harbor, Bridge Street and Main Street, uh, rock salt wasn't, now something was necessary. Calcium chloride might be better than salt if you're yeah. thinking talking about the environment, but yeah. to answer your question, um, I don't think we had, well, I've had a, a brand new snowblower for four years. It's got less than a half hour on it. <laughs> okay, well, that was my question. All right, 
So, uh, Paul, uh, let's go into deliberations, please. This is Paul Semple. I'll move to close the hearing and move into deliberations. Dave Veach seconds. Okay, we got a vote on that. Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. Paul. Sample votes yes. Buck. Thompson votes yes. Dave Thompson. Dave Thompson votes yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Uh, deliberations. Uh, Dave Veach, what do you think? Well, I think that um, the uh, the um, presentation shows that um, the uh, there's a unique aspect to the lot, and um, there would be hardship to the town, uh, um, and it does, and that it can meet uh, the uh, intent uh, of the bylaw without derogation from the intent of the bylaw. So um, I can find that it <clears throat> meets the criteria for a variance, and um, and I can um, I'm, I can support it with the comment that another gambrel. Okay, yeah. um, <laughs> I, I actually think it looks better as a gambrel style barn than the current building. So uh, <laughs> I'll go to the next. Thanks. All right, Paul. Yes, I agree. This is uh, somewhat of a unique lot, given the uh, situation on top of the landfill and the constraints of uh, drainage. So uh, given that and the hardship involved, uh, I can vote in favor of it. Buck? I feel it meets the criteria uh, required for uh, approving a variance. And I did note that the, it appeared the roof line was lower than the telephone poles on the bike path. So. It looks good to me. <laughs> Dave Thompson. <laughs> um, I'm going to go along with everybody else. It's kind of like a necessary evil. I'm going to vote yes. <laughs> Dennis. Um, yeah, Dennis Sullivan. Yeah, I think this meets the criteria for a variance legitimately in this case. And if I were voting, I would vote in favor of it. <laughs> Megan. If I were voting, I would vote for it. Bill. I would definitely vote for it. I think it's long overdue and uh, that building is in dire need of replacement, so. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> yeah. Well, as I said before, I, um, I don't like the idea of throwing salt around, but that's not my decision. And uh, I guess it makes sense to vote for it. Gee, that's two variants as I voted for today. I'm going to rot, you know, where. So, uh, all right. I don't think we need to condition this at all, Paul. So how about a motion to approve it? Yep, this is Paul Semple. I'll move to approve the application as submitted. Dave Veach seconds. All right. We need a vote, Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. Paul. Semple votes yes. Buck. Upson votes yes. Dave Thompson. Thompson, yes. And I vote yes, that's a unanimous decision. Thank you very much, Tyler. Thank you okay. all. Okay, other business. Oh, we've got approval of minutes from last meeting. Any comments on it by anybody? Paul Semple, I'll move to approve the minutes as submitted. Dave Veach seconds. Okay, uh, then we need a vote. Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. Paul. Sample votes yes. Buck. Thompson votes yes. Dave Thompson. Thompson, yes. And I vote yes. So I think we've come to the end of the line here, folks. We need a roll call to end the meeting. And it was a little longer now. Now, Bill, this is your first meeting. We don't usually. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I will give the board a heads up that our next three agendas all have six applications on each of them, and I already have three applications scheduled for our June 10th meeting. Okay, so, uh, so Bill, this, this might have been okay. quick. I got to tell you, when Megan joined the board in July, we <laughs> struck her with a six-hour meeting, and I remember calling her the next day, and she was saying, please tell me. This isn't what goes on every week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anyway, anyway. So uh, we need a vote just to uh, end this uh, meeting. And so, Dave Veach. Veach votes yes. All right, Paul. 
Temple votes yes. Buck. Upson votes yes. I'm going to call you later for the uh, snow count, Buck. Uh, Dave Thompson? Uh, Dave Thompson, yes. Dennis? Dennis Sullivan votes yes. Megan? Megan Story votes yes. Bill? Bill Grau votes yes. Yeah, all right, and I vote yes. And don't forget, we begin our next meeting with uh, a seance with Ali Sabatino to discuss the, her little uh, project. So bone up on that. If you have any questions in advance, get a hold of her. In the meantime, we stand adjourned. And Sarah, it is 7.04 here in Stage Harbor. I have 7.04 as well. We are officially adjourned. All right, very good. Over and out. Bye, guys.